Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of this mini course on extracting programs from proofs. Um, the goal for today would be to cover the main theorem of this course, the so-called soundness theorem of the realizability semantics, which is the workhorse for actually extracting programs from proofs. But before that, I would like to um, um, yeah, do a quick recap of what constructive mathematics is, and also look at a couple of the exercises and only then start with realizability. Do you have any questions, comments, ideas, which you want to raise right now, then you're most welcome. Also, people from the internet. Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. I don't understand the ctrl and Ctrl-C, Ctrl-A, that happens sometimes here. So Ctrl-C, Ctrl-A is the automatic mode of actor. Yeah? It's um, uh, for most tasks in mathematics, it's of no use at all. Yeah? So you cannot expect the automatic proof search of actor to solve your undergraduate homework. Yeah? Even though it's undergraduate, so Ctrl-C, Ctrl-A will fail miserably in most of the cases. Ctrl-C, Ctrl-A is really uh, a very, uh, very naive technique. It does not use like ChatGPT, artificial intelligence, whatever. It's really a very simple-minded thing. However, in some circumstances, Ctrl-C, Ctrl-A, the automatic proof search does work. And sometimes um, it produces um, proofs which are then unreadable to a human. Yeah, so like actor generally requires like just an instant to come up with a proof, which is then like perhaps even a couple lines long and which is impenetrable, at least on first sight to humans. That sometimes happens. Um, do you have a more a spe specific question regarding which of those exercises there was a problem with? Yeah. Did you just say, I didn't quite get it. Did you just say that it cannot prove B? Yes. Because that's just right. Um, B cannot be proven because actor is a constructive system by default. So as long as you don't postulate the law of through the middle or its equivalent cousin double negation elimination, you will not be able to fill in this hole. So that's actually a good thing that this didn't work. And, um, and perhaps let's also quickly think about this one. So you know that this is a classical tautology. Yeah? So in classical logic, um, uh, that, is, uh, that is well known. It's even in equivalence. Um, sometimes the implication A to B is even defined in classical logic as not A or B. Um, how about um, the, what's the status of this tautology in constructive mathematics? So for, for like, the point I'm trying to make is that even though constructive mathematics might be very new to many of you, um, and even so, so, so it might be outlandish at first, yeah? uh, one can very quickly develop a powerful intuition about constructive mathematics. Um, and with that powerful intuition, I can look at this statement and immediately declare that this is hopeless uh, to prove from a constructive point of view. That is intuition is just intuition. It can, it, it can be wrong sometimes. Um, but it is quite powerful and it's seldomly wrong. So why do I know for sure that this is most likely not provable in constructive mathematics? Recall the BHK interpretation. So recall what the logical symbols mean in constructive mathematics. An implication A to B means that we have a uniform procedure which turns witnesses for A into witnesses for B. 
Okay, this here means we have a witness for not A, or we have a witness for B. And we also know which one is the case. Well, how should that work? Given a procedure for turning witnesses for A into B, how should we ascertain anything about the status of not A or about the status of B? No hope. We just have a machine which um, would turn witnesses for A into witnesses of B, but we don't have a witness for A, we don't have a witness for B, we don't have a witness for not A, we don't have a witness for not B. Yeah. This in, in this direction, as it's stated on the inductor file, it, there's no hope that this can be proven in a constructive manner. Yeah? Yeah? Take B to be A. Uh huh. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. That is not only an argument. That like that is actually a proof. Um, uh, the special case of this in the case B equals A would imply the law of Slew middle, but the law of Slew middle is exactly the axiom which we took away from classical mathematics in order to arrive at constructive mathematics. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, we already discussed this one um, last time. Again, there is no hope of proving that constructively. From negative information, um, almost never we are able to um, extract positive information. It's always a, a non-trivial surprise when this does happen in constructive mathematics. Um, such a non-trivial surprise will not happen on like the very first exercise sheet, uh, subtask B. And here, this one is provable. Um, we, have, we have only negative information to start with, okay? But also we are not asked to come up with positive information. We are just asked with verifying not A, which is again negative, and we are asked with verifying not B, which is also again negative piece of evidence, negative piece of information. So that will work. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, here, you mean? Ah, ah to, to, in order to have an actual proof. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent idea. Right. If you specialize B to not A, then here we have A and not A, which is just false. Hence, that here is true. Hence, if B would be true, then that would also be true. Hence, we would have not A or not not A, which is not exactly the law of student middle, but a weak version of it, which is also not available in constructive mathematics. Um, I suggest that if um, you have more specific actor questions, let's tackle those later. Uh, because not all of them are interested in ACTA in the same uh, sense here, and I don't uh, want to, um, and I want to be careful with their time as well. Um, uh, but let's look perhaps at a couple of more of the exercises, not from the ACTA point of view, just from um, just from intuition, just from mathemat constructive mathematical intuition. For instance, what do you think about exercise F here? Every real number is zero or not zero. And compared with exercise E, every natural number is zero or not zero. In classical mathematics, both of these are trivial because both of these are just instances of the law of student. In constructive mathematics, um, each requires um, uh, its own analysis. Um, classical constru uh, constructive mathematics is backwards compatible to classical mathematics, by which I mean in constructive mathematics, we don't use the law of Sklun middle, but also we don't reject it, reject it in the sense of saying that it's false. We are just agnostic about the law of Sklun middle. Yeah? Hence, we cannot 
uh, immediately say that these two are false in constructive mathematics. Okay, what's the intuition about this one, about E? Let's, let's just have a quick poll. Uh, who believes that uh, this is acceptable in constructive mathematics? Couple, who believes this is not acceptable in constructive mathematics? Okay, and then the others are unsure. Um, let me tell you, this is acceptable in constructive mathematics. I will explain in a second. What about this one? Again, who believes this is acceptable in constructive mathematics? No one who believes this is not acceptable in constructive mathematics? Okay, a couple. Good morning, you're welcome. Um, so you're right, this is not acceptable in constructive mathematics. Okay, how do, you th do, how do I think about that? Well, one way of thinking about that is um, uh, foreshadowing a bit of what we will do today, um, that constructive mathematics and computable mathematics are intimately linked. They are not exactly the same, but they have a very close relationship. Hence, a similar, if not exactly the same question. A similar question is, can we write a computer program which reads a natural number n as input and then outputs yes or no, depending on whether that number is zero or not? And the answer is yes, that's possible. That's an exercise in programming. Even if um, some of you perhaps don't have much experience in programming, you can still imagine that for a seasoned programmer, it's possible to write down a computer program which decides whether a given input number is zero or not. Um, however, here, uh, no such luck. There will be no computer program which reads a real number as input and determines with certainty whether it's zero or whether it's not zero. Um, we can have an actual formal exercise about that later. Uh, for now, let me just give you the following idea. Um, a real number is given by um, better and better approximations. Yeah? And if uh, a given real number starts out like this, 3.141, then we don't even need to learn more approximations about the number. We can immediately conclude that the number is not zero. It started out with a three, okay? But if the number starts out with 0 0.00000, well, then it's unclear whether there will be infinitely, infinitely many zeros so that the number is actually precisely zero or whether somewhere in the as yet unexplored part of the approximations, uh, some, um, some non-zero digit appears, which would then tell us that the number itself is not zero. Yeah? And in finite time, you will not be able to settle that question. Hence, there is no computer program for determining this. And because of the close relationship between constructive mathematics and computable mathematics, you can then uh, come to the belief that, uh, this is, that this statement is not acceptable in constructive mathematics. And we will make the precise relationship between, um, um, we will make the relationship between constructive and computable mathematics precise in, in just like one hour. Um, here, uh, let me perhaps finish with this one. That's a fun one. By Q bar, I mean the algebraic numbers. These are a subset of the complex numbers um, containing not all complex numbers, but only those which are algebraic. Um, that is, which are the zero of some monic polynomial with rational coefficients. For instance, the square root of two is an algebraic number, but pi or E are not algebraic numbers. They are transcendental numbers. It turns out for algebraic numbers, you can prove this again in constructive mathematics. And hence, there is a computer program which given an algebraic number determines correctly whether it's zero or whether it's not zero. The reason is because um, a an algebraic number is more than just um, a sequence of better and better approximations. Instead, an algebraic number carries also the information of which polynomial it is a zero of. And thus, this additional piece of information um, allows you to, in order to, to computationally carry out the case distinction. Because you can, see, uh, can extract from the polynomial certain bounds, uh, which tell you that 
if the number is closer to zero than this error bound, then it definitely needs to be exactly zero. So the, that infinite problem of, uh, of looking at all the approximations is reduced to just a finite problem, namely just to, to determine the number with a certain amount of uh, accuracy and then do the check. Um, let's do one more, let's do this one. Um, so we already did that in ACTA last time. Let's now do it on the blackboard, yeah? just so that we see a, a different proof of that. Yeah? Um, claim phi implies not not phi. We don't have a camera in this room, which is why I'm using my laptop as a blackboard. Yeah? Proof. So in, if this was an exercise on day one of university in classical logic, then I would probably do a truth table, yeah? check the case phi equals true, phi equals false, and be done in, in those two cases. But now I'm claiming that this has a proof in constructive mathematics. Yeah? So we cannot do a case distinction as to whether phi is true or false. Instead, um, we have to use the, yeah, the standard approach for verifying an implication. Namely, we assume the antecedent and then try to verify the conclusion. Yeah? So assume phi, we need to show not not phi. Um, recall what not, how not has been defined. Not has been defined as um, implying implication, uh, implying contradiction. So this. Last time on the actual blackboard, I wrote a lightning symbol for contradiction. Now let's be more formal, proper logicians, and write the bottom symbol. It means exactly the same contradiction, but that is the more formal symbol to use. So we are in the situation to show an implication. Hence, we do as always, we assume what's to the left of that implication symbol and try to prove the right one. So assume not phi we need to show bottom. Now observe, we have phi available and we have not phi available. And recall, not phi is just an iteration for phi implies bottom. So combining phi and the information that if phi were true, then bottom, we obtain bottom by modus ponens. Yeah? by combining the assumptions phi and phi implies bottom, we obtain bottom. And that is exactly what we needed to show. So that is a constructive proof that phi implies not not phi. Any questions, comments, ideas, thoughts on this claim or proof? Would you appreciate seeing one more of these kinds of exercises? One more? Or would you prefer that we go to other things? Quick Paul, who would like one more of those? OK, then let's go on. Um, thank you for the, your feedback. Um, OK, then let's just summarize. Um, or let me just state again what constructive mathematics is. Constructive mathematics is a certain flavor of mathematics, which uh, aspires to be more informative. Um, some people would say that constructive math mathematics is simply a better kind of mathematics. And personally, I would agree. Personally, I enjoy doing constructive mathematics more than I enjoy doing classical mathematics. However, um, we do not need to, uh, to have this kind of value judgment. Um, um, uh, also, a very good point of view is to say, well, there are many flavors of mathematics, um, cl classical mathematics, constructive mathematics, several more, and all are beautiful and all have their uses. In particular, their applications of constructive mathematics to classical mathematics, and also the other way around. So um, one, one doesn't really need to uh, 
to, to argue for one, one side. Constructive mathematics historically emerged um, from philosophical objections with, with classical mathematics. Yeah? And then it was really a fierce battle uh, known as the so-called Grundlagenstreit, foundational crisis in the mathematics. Yeah? But nowadays, I would just say, well, there are many flavors. All of them are interesting. They, are, they have interrelations. They have uses. Yeah? So we don't need to be um, argumentative about that. Um, constructive mathematics feels like a restriction of classical mathematics because we took a couple of axioms away, namely law of the middle, law of double negation, elimination, and the axiom of choice. We did those three away because those axioms and none other of classical mathematics. Only those three um, are responsible for unconstructivity, for the, those situations that proofs um, don't contain as much information as one would perhaps like. Like with the very first example from yesterday about irrational numbers, which give a rational um, power, um, where, where, where the proof did not really tell us an example. Yeah? Uh, a close study of all the axioms of classical mathematics shows just three of them are problematic from a constructive point of view. All the others are fine. Um, noting that in this sense, constructive mathematics is a restriction of classical mathematics. One can, of course, ask um, yeah, which results of classical mathematics are still available in constructive mathematics. And uh, the answer is, um, Perhaps surprisingly, almost all, almost all results of classical mathematics are available in constructive mathematics. However, often some work is required in order to um, um, find better ways of expressing the ideas of classical mathematics so that they then become acceptable in constructive mathematics. Um, if you just take a, a textbook on classical mathematics literally, then you will find either explicitly or implicitly, usually many appeals to the law of absolute middle or the law of, law of double negation elimination or the axiom of choice. Sometimes applications of the axiom of choice are marked with like an asterisk, yeah, but also often not. Um, so on face value, in any case on face value, um, classical mathematicians are using these forbidden axioms all, all the time, but then it turns out that with more work, we can reformulate the proofs and uh, then obtain uh, constructive analogs of their results. Um, depending on the subject, the reformulation, uh, reformulations required will be very tiny or might be quite extensive, Espe especially in topology, for instance. Um, the, at least the, the usual, the, it's also an active area of research. Yeah? Uh, and uh, constructive mathematicians are enjoying uh, looking at the classical results and trying to constructivize them. But one standard approach of making sense of topology and constructive mathematics is to ditch topological spaces altogether and instead work with something which is called locales um, or point-free topology, which are a version of topological spaces um, in which the points of the spaces are not fundamental. The opens still are important and are fundamental and make sense, but we, uh, we, from, we, we don't stress the importance of points any longer. In particular, in that branch of topology, a space can be very interesting, um, even if it doesn't have any points at all. This is at odds with the standard notion of topological space where topological space without any points is just empty and um, not, not worth speaking about. So that's in topology, but there are also other branches where um, just tiny form uh, reformulations are required. Question, yeah? Excellent question. How do we define an open if not by saying, well, it's a set of points uh, validating certain properties? Um, uh, we could have a bonus session on that because it's really, really fun. Um, uh, the short answer is, um, you do the following. So remembering for a second topological spaces again, um, then note that um, every topological space has a set of all its open subsets. And this is not only a set 
instead it carries certain properties for instance and structure for instance um, it is a partially ordered set because given two opens um, there's a truth value as to whether the first one is obtained uh, is included in the second one and then notice it's not an arbitrary partial order but it's a partial order with certain properties for instance um, it has binary meets corresponding to the fact that the intersection of two opens is again open and it has arbitrary uh, joints corresponding to the fact that the um, arbitrary union of opens is again open. Yeah? And now what you do in order to define what a local is, you just say, well, a local is given by a partial order, verifying exactly the same properties which the partial orders from topological spaces satisfy, but you no longer require that the elements of the partial orders are actual sets of points. They can be anything. Yeah? That is one approach. There are several others um, all, all related. And then there's a new approach, which I learned from Yusuf just yesterday. Uh, ask him over, over lunch if you're interested in that. Um, but that's the general idea. OK. Um, and let me also uh, reiterate this warning. Um, in actual fact, constructive mathematics is an expansion of classical mathematics, not a restriction. We will get to that tomorrow. Um, but for now, I would just like to show you one more example and then uh, go uh, progress to realizability. One more example where constructive mathematics is of use for classical mathematics. Yeah? So all, philo all philosophical um, ideas aside, just uh, very, um, uh, very like objective stuff. Let's just see an application of constructive mathematics and classical mathematics. Um, I'm sure you know the intermediate value theorem of a mathematical analysis, which states, if you have a continuous function like this one, from the reals to the reals, and if that function is negative at some point and positive at some other, then between those two points, there will be at least one zero of the function. In this particular example, there are even three zeros. Okay, that's the intermediate value theory. Between a negative and a positive value, there's at least one zero. Um, does this theorem have a constructive proof? Perhaps you happen to recall the standard proof of that fact. Standard proof is by subdivision. You subdivide the interval um, into two parts, so the left part and the right part. And then you consider the midpoint value of the function and you check whether it's positive zero or negative. And depending on the result, you then iterate. But carrying out this check is not possible in constructive mathematics. And that is why it's reasonable to suspect, and in fact true, that this theorem as stated is not available in constructive mathematics. So why is that interesting from a classical point of view? Um, that is about this parameter dependence. What if we are not interested in a single function, but in a family of functions, um, which var varies continuously in a parameter? I got an example for you, um, this one here. Here's the family of functions yeah, drawn out over time. All those functions are continuous. All of those functions are negative here and positive there. And hence, in classical mathematics, all those functions have a zero. A classical mathematician might now wonder whether that zero depends continuously on the parameter. And the answer is, no, it doesn't. And you see it here, the zero jumps from the left to the right. That's a discontinuity. That is interesting from a classical point of view. Yeah, If you're studying, studying analysis, studying um, continu discontinuities and continuity is, is very important. OK, and um, yeah, how does constructive mathematics help here? Help here? Well, uh, if I'm constructively trained, I can um, immediately, when I approach this situation, already give a very good guess that Indeed, the zero will not depend continuously on the parameter because um, 
because the uh, intermediate value theorem is not provable in constructive mathematics. So we, we don't have a precise method theorem like a theorem is provable in constructive mathematics if and only if it also holds in a continuous parameter dependent fashion, but we almost have this kind of equivalence. And, um, um, and so uh, it's a very good source of making quick guesses, which often are correct. Um, let me give you a second example, um, this one from linear algebra. I appreciate that not all of you are familiar with linear algebra. Um, this slide will vanish in like two minutes and then it will never appear again. So you don't need to feel lost. Uh, but I also know that some of you have uh, have took uh, took linear algebra and you will appreciate this example. Um, let, a matrix may, uh, let a symmetric matrix be given, n times n matrix, um, where all the entries depend continuously on some parameter t. Then you know from linear algebra that for every parameter value t, um, this um, uh, there's, uh, the matrix has a full list of eigenvalues and that there is an eigenvalue, eigenvector basis. Their motto is symmetric matrices are diagonalizable. Okay. Now the question is, uh, the advanced question, not tackled in linear algebra, can those eigenvalue picking functions, lambda i, can those be uh, chosen to be continuous? Do the eigenvalues depend continuously on the parameter t? And bonus question, do the eigenvectors depend continuously about the parameter t? That is a question from um, mathematical analysis. It's an interesting question from the point of view of classical mathematics. Let me give you the answers. The answer to the first question is yes. The answer to the second question is no. But um, the answer to the second question is yes again, if we uh, allow uh, to remove a couple of, of exceptional points. So the answer is yes on our dense open subset of our space of parameters. Okay, and a classical mathematician uh, will, uh, will need to prove these two effects. Yes, no, and yes again. Constructive mathematics helps us here um, because in order to analyze this parameter dependent classical situation, we can just as well analyze just the situation of a single matrix with fixed numbers, no continuous parameter dependence in there, just a single symmetric matrix, symmetric matrix, and then ask whether constructively we are able to prove that it has um, a full list of eigenvalues and an eigenvector basis. If the constructive answer is yes, then we can be sure that um, also the answer to the parameter dependent situation is yes. If constructively we cannot show it, then most likely um, there will also no be con uh, there will also be not be a continuous parameter dependence. Okay, and that's exactly what hap what happens. We can prove in constructive math mathematics that symmetric matrices have a full list of eigenvalues. However, I cannot quite prove that they also have an eigenvector basis. We can only prove that it's not not the case that such a matrix has an eigenvector basis. And the not not corresponds to this requirement of getting rid of a couple of exceptional points. So the double negation, which is perhaps a very subtle logical thing at first, translates through this lens of parameter dependence to a very down to earth um, situation, namely to removing exceptional points from a certain domain. So double negation acquires a geometric meaning uh, under that lens. Any questions, comments, ideas regarding that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it, should, it's, uh, it's, it should depict um, 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 a principal component analysis in statistics, um, where um, which is which relies on the eigenvector basis, and uh, you see like the, the the main direction of variance is this direction corresponding to the um, eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. 
Any further questions, thoughts? Okay, good. Um, let's uh, start with the with realizability. Realizability. The main goal of the day will be to explain the following theory. That is the theory which um, allows us to extract programs from proofs. Um, and I realized that uh, there are several uh, symbols and uh, names in that theorem which you are not familiar with, I will explain those. So um, that at the end mean is pronounced as phi is realized. And that means that, um, that there's a program witnessing phi. There is a program witnessing phi. And this one here means H A proves phi. Um, where H A is heighting arithmetic, a certain foundational system, which we will use as a basis for today. So the theorem states, if a statement is provable, then it is realized. Then there is a program witnessing it. Yeah? So that theorem is the workhouse which allows us to extract programs from proofs. And that theorem itself um, can be proven in a constructive manner. So um, we can actually transform a given proof into a progress program witnessing the proven claim. It's not only the statement that theoretically in the platonic heaven, there exists a program witnessing phi. No, we can actually carry out the transformation. Any proof, any constructive proof can be turned into a program. Um, and to give, uh, you might wonder what, why this is, to, to, give, um, to give a first example, yeah. Um, H proves that um, beyond every number n, there's a prime p larger than n. Hence, there's a program uh, which reads a number n as input and outputs a prime p larger than n. That is a basic example of, uh, of this theory. Going from a proof that beyond every number there is a prime number to a program which actually computes prime numbers uh, larger than the given input. And you might wonder what uh, use, the use of that. Um, I recorded a couple. Um, one is for so-called integrated developments. Um, we call one approach to software development is the following. You, you write down your program and then you hope that it's correct. Perhaps you do testing, uh, perhaps with users, perhaps with test cases, perhaps uh, you just are very careful in programming, but uh, more or less uh, not bother to verify the correctness further. That's probably the standard approach to programming in real life. But then computer science, we can do better at the ex, uh, 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 and, all, and also invest more work then. Um, namely, we can also verify that our algorithms work correctly. We can do this verification on a piece of paper with a mathematical proof or in a proof assistant like ACTA or whatever. Uh, that is also a nice approach. And then there's something, something which I consider to be a kind of holy grail in program development. Namely, we don't bother to separately first program the program, code the program, 
and then verify its correctness by some method. Instead, we just give one single integrated development from this, from which the program can automatically extract it all. So for instance, I prove that every list can be sorted. I prove that in a proof assistant, and then automatically a sorting algorithm can be extracted from that. And I know from the meta theorem that this algorithm will be correct. So I no longer will need to separately verify its correctness. That's the, the holy grail. Personally, I am working on making integrated developments in that specific sense possible in algebraic geometry. So I want to prove that the cohomology of some scheme with respect to some sheaf is that and that. And then from that obtain a computer program which does the, the cohomology computation. Um, so that's nice. Another is um, for meta theory. Uh, for instance, um, to prove the following. Here. And let me be fully explicit by bracketing. If heighting arithmetic, a certain foundational system, which I'll introduce in a couple of moments, if heighting arithmetic proves um, a disjunction, proves alpha or beta, then um, in fact, heighting arithmetic already proves alpha or heighting arithmetic proves beta. That is called the so-called disjunction property. And it's a um, property which is shared by uh, many constructive foundational systems. And it's a property which is totally false for classical foundational systems. Um, totally false for classical systems like PA or ZFZ. Um, so P, P8 um, uh, will very often prove alpha or not alpha because classical systems like piano arithmetic prove the law of absolute middle by an axiom, right? So classical systems like PA will always prove alpha or not alpha for any alpha, but they might not be powerful enough in order to prove either alpha or to prove not alpha. Yeah, but because they are statements, um, you learn that in courses on logic, uh, that there's Gödel's incompleteness theorem, uh, which provides us with an example for a statement which can neither be proven nor be refuted. So there will never, neither be a proof of that statement nor a proof of its negation. But still a classical system will prove that statement or its negation. Yeah. So classical, for, uh, totally false for classical systems true for heighting arithmetic and also other constructive systems. Um, and the way to prove that is uh, through a, the detour of realizability. There are also other proofs, but that is, uh, that is a nice way of proving that. So meta theory. Um, then as usual, that, that also has like philosophical uh, ramifications. Um, let's not go into that right now. Let me mention the, the final use for me. Um, recognizing or understanding proofs. So not all proofs which you find in classic textbooks are transparent. Some of them are quite complex and you, you don't really understand them. You checked every single step, but you st still haven't like got the big picture. Yeah? Realizability can help you with that because um, with realizability, with a theorem, you can extract a program from the proof and then study that program um, and hence use the language intuition of programming of computer science in order to understand that program. And uh, then perhaps uh, things can, can make more, more sense. What also happens is that you might encounter two totally different looking proofs of the same theorem, do that program extraction and then notice that the extracted program is one and the same. Um, then, then you have also learned something interesting about those proofs, namely that 
even though they have been using totally different language, um, they in fact express using their different language, the same mathematical core idea because the extractive program is the same. I think that's the users. Um, I think uh, for practical applications, this one is the most important, the one on integrated developments. Um, and, um, but other than that, let me just remark that it's, um, that it's a very important fact that computable mathematics and constructive mathematics, and then by extension, classical mathematics as well, we'll learn about that tomorrow, but they are so closely related. Uh, even if it didn't have any applications, I would still be amazed by that fact. Because when I grew up, I thought that programming and proving would be separate activities. And now this theorem, well, it's just one implication to the right, not to the left. But ignoring this, uh, this subtlety, uh, this theorem tells us that uh, it can be improved in a certain, uh, so there's a variant where we have an if and only if. Um, this theorem tells us that there's no difference between proving and programming because from any proof, we can extract a program. And if we change the setting a little bit, then also from every program, we get a proof. And that is just a basic, basic and wonderful fact. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I will say lots of things about the converse uh, scattered throughout uh, today, and perhaps tomorrow. Um, let me just find that uh, chat window again for the people in the internet. Just a second. Good. Um, sorry. Good. Um, Let's, um, so my plan will be to, um, into, to properly define this one. What does it mean that heighting arithmetic proves a statement that there's a, an HA proof of phi? And then also to introduce this one and then um, start the proof of the theory. Yeah? That will be the general plan. But before that, uh, I would like to do a couple of examples uh, so that you get the general idea first. Um, and those uh, general examples are um, uh, given in a set of slides, which uh, I didn't link, I just noticed. Um, they are here. I will put the link uh, online later. Um, here, I would like to do these examples. Okay, we will have a look at a couple of statements, not all of them. And we will ask whether that statement ho holds in classical mathematics and whether it's realizable, whether there's a realizer for it, whether there's a program witnessing it. And in each case, we will um, try to understand what the elite program should do in order to get a feeling for what it means for a program to witness a statement. And then I will give you the formal definition and hopefully the formal definition will then just make sense um, because, uh, because you have built up the required intuition first. So every number is prime or not prime. Every natural number is prime or not prime. This is a statement which is true in classical mathematics. Moreover, it's trivially true because it's just an instance of the law of absolute middle. You don't need to know anything about prime numbers, not even the definition in order to conclude that this is true in classical mathematics. And it's also realizable because um, there's, a there's a program witnessing this statement. What should the, such a program do? Um, in order for a program to be a witness of that statement, it needs to have the following behavior. It needs to read a natural number as input and then determine yes or no, whether it's prime or not. Okay, and it's indeed possible to, to code such a program, a primality checker, 
Um, it's not entirely trivial if you are not familiar with programming, but it can certainly be done. Um, and hence, that statement is realizable. Another way to justify that this statement is realizable is by observing that this statement has a constructive proof. And by that theorem displayed on the board, we know that from any constructive proof, we can obtain a realizer, a program witnessing the statement. Beyond every number, there's a prime number. We just studied that example on the board. This holds in classical mathematics. It also holds in constructive mathematics. Um, hence, there's a program with witnessing it, namely a prime searching program. Every map from n to n has a zero or does not have a zero. This is a statement which is trivially true in classical mathematics because yet again, it's just an instant of the laws of student middle. It is not realizable, however. How would a program, a hypothetical program witnessing the statement look like? This program would be a kind of oracle which reads a function f from n to n as input and then somehow determines whether that function has a zero or not. That's not possible for an ordinary program. Um, a program can simulate another program and thereby determine the values f of zero, f of one, f of two, and so on and so forth. Um, but if all those values turn out to be zeros, then in finite time, that's not enough to conclude that there will never be as, um, uh, if all those function values are not zeros, then in finite time, this will not be enough to conclude that there will never be a zero. There can be a zero in the as of yet unexplored ranged range of the function. So this statement is not realizable. And hence it's not provable in constructive mathematics. Because if it was provable in constructive mathematics, then it would be realizable. Every map from n to n is computable by a Turing machine. Every map from n to n is computable by a Turing machine. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the notion of Turing machines, but perhaps not all of you. Um, let me give you a like, two sentence summary. A Turing machine can be pictured as an idealized kind of computer, um, a computer just like this laptop. However, a computer which unlike this laptop um, can never break, never runs out of disk space, never runs out of like a battery. It's an idealized kind of computer. Um, as soon as the disk space is close to running out, somebody just will attach a new hard drive to it. That's how we can picture Turing machines, idealized models of computation. There are many models of computation in use in computer science. Um, perhaps you prefer the lambda calculus that can also be used. Uh, and then there are many, many more. And for every model of computation, there is a flavor of realizability. And for starters, we will just be concerned with the um, historically first flavor of realizability where we employ Turing machines as the model of computation. Okay, every map from n to n is computable. This statement is widely false in classical mathematics. There are many functions from n to n which are not computable by Turing machines. Um, uh, for instance, um, the function which uh, reads the number n as input and then output zero or one, depending on whether the nth Turing machine in some list of all Turing machines terminates or does not terminate. The so-called halting function. This is a perfectly well-defined function in classical mathematics. We can write down that function. We can prove a state and prove properties about it, but it will not be computable by a Turing machine because there is no halting oracle. That is a fact we learn in computability theory. There is no program which given a program could analyze whether that other program terminates or does not terminate, whether it gets trapped in some kind of loop or whether it comes to an end. Such an halting oracle is not possible. And correspondingly, here it's still a question mark, but uh, correspondingly, this statement is 
not realizable. Because a program witnessing the statement would precisely be a halting oracle, would be a program which reads a program as input and then somehow um, outputs um, a Turing machine computing that program. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was confused. Let's backtrack uh, uh, the, the last minute. Surprisingly, this statement, this statement here is realizable. In fact, it's trivially realizable. It's trivial to write a program which, given a program, computes a Turing machine for computing that program. We just have to output the same program again. The Unix command line utility cat, C-A-T, does the job. The Unix command line utility cat is a witness for this statement. This statement is widely false in classical mathematics, but it does have a realizer because there is a program which satisfies the following job requirement. That program should read a program as input, a program which computes a function from the in, and then output a program which would compute the same function. That's trivial to do just output the same program handed into you. Mm -hmm. That would be false, yeah. The thing is, um, so not every function from end to end is computable. That's just a fact of life, okay? At least if we are working in a classical meta theory where I can indeed prove that every function from end to end is, that not every function from end to end is computable, okay? Um, so in particular, um, if I have some function in mind, you will not be able to come up with a program for computing that function because I might have a, an, an uncomputable function in mind. However, the calling conventions are different in realizability. Um, so um, a program witnessing the statement doesn't have the task of um, somehow coming up with a Turing machine for any given function end to end which exists in the platonic heaven. It just has to come up with a Turing machine for any function from to n, which is given to it in the form of a program. And that, th this definition regarding the calling conventions makes it trivial to then come up with a Turing machine which computes that program because the Turing machine was already given to it. Indeed. Indeed, in, the, in this setting of realizability, um, uh, there will be maps which you have in mind, which, which however, you cannot give to that program, uh, because to give a program, uh, to give a function to a program means, by definition, in this flavor of realizability, to give a Turing machine for computing that function. Because in, reali in this flavor of realizability, everything needs to be computable in, in some sense. So all, all the inputs, as well, and that's the reason. So uh, the, that we have a check mark here is not a deep insight; it's just a trivial consequence of the way things are set up. But still, it's an interesting insight. Um, there are many, many flavors of realizability. Um, also, flavors where uh, we can work with functions which itself are not computable. Um, uh, where we then would have uh, a cross sign in that column. But let's first stick to the uh, historically first flavor of realizing. Quick question. Um, this statement here, again, every map from end to end is computable. Um, is, uh, can we prove that in constructive mathematics? Every map from end to end is computable. I mean, it is realize, realized. Can we prove it in constructive mathematics? Yeah. Mm 
exactly. We cannot prove the statement in class in constructive mathematics because if we could, then that very same proof would also be acceptable in classical mathematics, contradicting the well-known classical fact that not all functions from entry are computable, right? So this is uh, this is an example for a statement, um, which um, which distinguishes constructive mathematics from realizability theory, because this statement is realizable, but does nevertheless still not have a constructive proof. So this is uh, part one of N of a partial answer to use of questions from before. Can you say something about the reverse um, from um, a program witnessing a statement to a proof? Here you see an example for where the reverse direction does not work. We have a program witnessing the statement, but no proof of the statement, no constructive proof of the statement. Um, let's do all the others at some undetermined later time, point in time, unless you have a quick question right now. Yes. Yeah. Yes, right. Which is why it's good that there are lots of flavors of realizability. And there are also flavors for which um, we have a precise if and only if relation between um, uh, provability and realizability. But um, this kind of realizability, which we are studying right now, um, yeah, loses a bit of information, which is why uh, it's, uh, which explains the failure of the reversal direction. So, the program extracted from a proof has less information than the proof itself. Um, and, this the, um, and this extra freedom so that the program does not need to contain all the um, um, information from the original proof is what um, allows the reversal direction to fail and which also allows um, things like uh, this to hold uh, in realizability, while it's uh, not um, available to us in classical or constructive mathematics. And then there are more informative versions of realizability where this uh, kind of defect is repaired. But let me also say that it's not necessarily a defect because um, often in life it's also useful to, on purpose, um, strip some information, to, to remove some information so that we can focus on what remains. Yeah? And uh, I think the classical flavor of realizability, the one we are currently discussing, does that job quite well uh, because it like extracts the algorithmic essence of a proof, disregarding stuff about the proof which is not of importance to algorithmics. Yeah? Okay, um, are there any any other questions, thoughts, comments um, 
on these uh, particular examples. Else I would uh, continue with uh, the formal definition. And my plan would be to show you the formal definition and then do a break because this has already been going on for some time and then continue, that would be the plan. Okay, good, then let's define that. Um, okay, definition. Um, we say that a statement is realized if and only if um, there exists a number E such that um, more precisely, E realizes phi. And uh, now I will need to define what it means for a number to realize phi. E realizes phi. So the symbol at the beginning means phi is realizable at all. And the definition states, well, phi is realizable at all if there exists some number E such that this particular number realizes phi. This E here is just a natural number, but we picture E to be a program. Um, we picture E to denote the ETH Turing machine in some adequate enumeration of all Turing machines. This flavor of realizability was introduced by um, Kleine and um, uh, in I think the, the 50s or 60s. Yeah? And at that point, um, uh, people in foundations were very careful to be very minimal about which kinds of objects they allow in their ontology. And that is why uh, they use natural numbers for coding all sorts of stuff. Nowadays, we would perhaps not go this detour with the net about the natural numbers and just say, well, if there exists a Turing machine E such that E realizes phi, yeah? and indeed that's one of the modern variants of realizability, but the old um, uh, definition also has uh, its merits, which is why I'm uh, um, uh, copying the, the original approach. But we imagine to have a list of all Turing machines, uh, like all Turing machines with um, zero states, with one state, with two states, three states, ordered in some manner. I don't particularly care. It's just important that we have a list of all Turing machines. It's an infinitely long list. And every Turing machine occurs somewhere in that list. And then we can address Turing machines by their index in that list. Okay. Okay, and now we will define um, the clauses for um, for this realizability semantics. For instance, we will define what it means that um, that E is a realizer for an implication. And we uh, yeah, declared as follows, um, if and only if, if and only for every R such that um, R realizes phi, um, E times R realizes psi. What do we mean by E times R? By E times R, I mean that we apply the input R to the ETH Turing machine and then consider the output. Yeah? E times R is the result of applying the input R to the ETH Turing machine.
not all Turing machines terminate with a well-formed natural number on all inputs. Therefore, I should be a little bit more specific. Uh, I should, um, or more precise, I should write this as follows. Like this, I included this stuff now. This here means um, the computation, the computation E times R um, terminates with a well-formed natural number. Okay, so that's the definition. And I hope that it makes sense, especially when you compare it with the BHK interpretation of constructive mathematics, more precisely of the implication of constructive mathematics, because that interpretation stated that a witness for an implication is a uniform procedure which transforms witnesses for the assumption into witnesses for the conclusion. And that is exactly what is spelled out here um, in the language of Turing machines. A number E, pictured as the E Turing machine, realizes this implication, if and only if, for any realizer of the assumption, feeding this realizer R into E terminates with some natural number, such that this new natural number realizes time. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a look at the other clauses. Um, but at some point, um, um, yeah, you will need to ask questions if the definition is unclear, yeah? but perhaps with the second clause of definition, um, things will get clearer. Um, when does a program witness a conjunction? The BHK interpretation stated that a witness for a conjunction for phi and psi consists of a sub-witness for phi and a sub-witness for psi. Correspondingly, I think it's natural to require the following. If a program would like to witness, to realize a conjunction phi and psi, then it should output a pair consisting of a realizer for phi and a realizer for psi. And that's exactly the definition. Um, What do I mean by pi one applied to E? Uh, pi one for first projection is the Turing machine which extracts the first component out of, of a pair. Where pi i is the Turing machine which extracts the ith component from a pair. So that's the clause for conjunction. Do you have a proposal for universal quantification for this? So what should a realizer for a universally quantified statement be? What should it do? Is 
if you recall one of the early examples, for instance, for instance the example rega um, regarding the statement beyond every natural number n, there's a prime number larger than n. Informally, we agreed, or I stated, that a realizer for the statement should be a Turing machine which reads an arbitrary number n as input and then computes a prime larger than that number n. So if you have this example in mind, what should a realizer for a universal quantification like this be? What should it do? Yes? Uh huh. Uh huh. Exactly. Very good. Thanks. That's exactly the definition. A realizer for a universal quantified statement is a Turing machine uh, such that for every number x, Applying X to the Turing machine terminates. And it does not terminate with some junk value with 42. Instead, it terminates with a realizer for phi of that X. Exactly. Very good. Um, let's have uh, one more. Um, what should be a realizer for an existential, for an exist, uh, existential quantification. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. And those two ingredients should be packaged up as a pair, right? Yeah. So we can copy the first line of the definition below and then state exactly what she said. Um, um, this one realizes phi of um, this one. Huh? So E is a realizer for an existential quantification. If it's possible, if and only if it's possible to extract the first and second component in such a way that the first component is some natural number, such that phi of that natural number is realized by the second component. Exactly. Okay, um, very quickly, let's do um, three base cases. Um, what should a realizer for bottom be? Well, there should not be a realizer for bottom. Yeah. Uh, let me just write it like this. Uh, so no, no E whatsoever should count as a realizer for bottom. Um, dually, um, what should count as a realizer for top? the trivially true statement, um, well, there, there is no particular need in order to, to, to witness top. Top is a trivially true statement. Hence, um, we just say if true. Yeah? So any number whatsoever is a realizer for top. 42 is a realizer for top. 23 is a realizer for, for top. One more. If X and Y are terms for natural numbers, when should a number E be regarded as a realizer for that? It's similar to the situation here. Um, this, a statement that two terms of natural numbers evaluate to the same natural number um, it, uh, does not require a special witness. We can always just compute the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and then just look whether they are the same or not. Yeah? Hence, we will not require anything in particular uh, of E. We just require that the statement itself holds. Yeah? 
So um, uh, if the denotation of x equals the denotation of y, uh, with these the, those funny uh, brackets indicate that um, x and y are perhaps not natural numbers themselves, but terms for natural numbers still containing, for instance, the SUC operation. Yeah? Uh, and here we say, well, evaluate those two terms to actual natural numbers. OK, and if those actual num natural numbers uh, are identical, then any number e whatsoever counts as a realizer, and else no number whatsoever counts as a realizer. OK, and then the only thing missing is uh, this junction. Um, this junction is as follows. Um, both things, uh, again, E should be a pair, yeah? Um, and then the following. This. So a realizer for a disjunction is a pair in that its first and its second component can be extracted. And if the first component happens to be zero, then the second component should be a realizer for phi. And if the first component happens to be non-zero, then the second component should be a realizer for psi. Yeah, so uh, summarizing as a realizer for a disjunction is a pair of a number zero and one, zero or one, and some other realizer. If the num first uh, um, component is zero, then that should be a realizer for phi and else for psi. Yeah, and these, um, these are the rules of realizability semantics. And with these rules, we could, we could, we don't, won't, but we could um, now recheck all those cases, except for cases three and four, because I did not give um, uh, rules for quantifying over functions. I just gave rules for quantifying over functions, uh, over natural numbers. Let me be more precise here by adding um, colon n here. Yeah? Uh, but there are similar clauses for quantifying over functions. Uh, with those rules, we could verify these, um, that these two are realizable. And we could also uh, verify many other examples, but I propose that we do a break. And I think I will take all the questions you might have regarding uh, this in the break, um, so that those who don't have a question for that uh, have a longer break. And I propose we do like a, a 10 minute break, something like that, yeah? Good, then 10 minute break, um, yeah.
Okay. Welcome back after the break. Let's finish this chapter. What we did was to yeah, have quite a long definition, but it's a modular definition. It contains one clause for each logical connective. And these, uh, uh, together, these clauses explain us which numbers are deemed realizers for which statements. So summarizing, we just explained uh, what a program needs to do in order to witness a statement. For instance, to witness an implication, the more formal term in that situation is to say to realize. To realize an implication means that E should be capable of the following feat. Given any realizer for phi, e, uh, um, R applied to E should terminate, and the resulting value should be a realizer for psi. In other words, E should be a uniform procedure which transforms witnesses, realizers for psi, phi into witnesses or realizers for psi, exactly as the BHK interpretation already suggested. Yes. Minimal in which sense? Yeah, I mean, if you if you remove one of the clauses, let me, let's say this one, okay, um, then you no longer have a working definition um, because we want to explain um, what it means for an arbitrary first order statement to be realized. And first order statements contain may contain universal quantification. So yes, I cannot remove a single clause of here. I could. Um, perhaps simplify a little bit on the right hand side. Um, um, I could, for instance, simplify that like this. Um, but, um, but I wouldn't do that. I think that is a correct simplification. Um, but I wouldn't do that because I, I like it better in the original uh, form. Any other questions, comments? Okay, then um, let's run an example. Yeah. Um, let's um, run an example um, here. Um, let's check how realizers for negated statements look like. So what does E need to do in order to realize not phi? Let's check. Um, firstly, recall not is just an abbreviation for implying bottom. Yeah? So this uh, means nothing else as this. And now we can use that definition. So if uh, for every number r such that r realizes phi, um, e times r terminates and it terminates with a witness of bottom. So that results just from applying the definition. But now we can simplify, it, simplify further. Recall, E times R never realizes bottom because we said so down below. Okay, so um, we can simplify as follows. If for every R in N such that R realizes phi, this holds and also contradiction holds. Thus that can be simplified to just uh, contradiction. In other words, if 
there is no R in N such that R realizes phi. If um, it's not the case that phi is realizable. Okay, so a number E realizes not phi if and only if it is the case that phi is not realizable. Do you notice something peculiar about this equivalence, what is result? Hmm? Yes, yeah, yes. And that was like the central step from, from here to there. But that's not what I mean. Of course, it's, I mean, it's an open question. How should you infer what, what, which peculiarity I have in mind? But notice, we set out to derive um, a simple characterization of what it means for number E to realize not phi. We did some computation using the definition and simplifying. And then we uh, arrived at this final result. And notice this final result does not mention E at all. That is the reason why we say in realizability that realizers for negative statements are not informative. If not phi is realized at all, then it is so by any number whatsoever. Hence, if not phi is realized at all, then it is so by any number whatsoever. Because a negative statement like not phi is realized if and only if it just so happens that phi is not realizable, but that no longer depends on E. Let's do one more example. Let's check what it means for number E to realize the double negation of phi. Okay, first let's use our result from just before um, like this. Perhaps I should use psi here so that's clearer. So E realizes not not psi if and only if it's not the case that not psi is realizable. So this can be um, spelled out to say um, to this. Now recall some statement is realized if it's realized by some R. And now we can use our observation from just before again. So not exists R such that, so not this. And now we can, um, uh, I think, I would like to permute existential and uh, negation. Um, I don't see it right now. I want to obtain the following result. Um, not not
Is that is that a correct simplification? I'm I'm slow right now. Do you any, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Good. I, I, I didn't quite get it, but I recall that this is the correct end result to, uh, we need to arrive at. Um, so I, I accept it. I just don't see uh, the simplification from here to there right now, but, but uh, let's not uh, stop the course over that. So the end result is um, a doubly negated statement is realized if in the platonic heaven, there exists a realizer for psi. However, this E does not need to contain the R. So E realizes not not psi if and only if um, E promises to us that somewhere there is a realizer for psi, however, E does not need to give us this, uh, this realizer. And that explains uh, why, for instance, we typically don't have the following. For most psi, um, we don't have that it's realized that not not psi implies psi. That would be the law of double negation elimination. Because a realizer for this would amount to a Turing machine which reads a realizer for not not psi as input and then outputs a realizer for psi. However, uh, the realizer, uh, the, the input is of no use whatsoever uh, because it just promises that there is some R such that R realizes psi, but it doesn't give any indication as to how to find that R. Okay. For some psi, it might be possible to reconstruct the promised but not given realizer R, but for general psi, this will not work. And I will include, it's not yet in the exercise sheet, but I will include as soon as I'm on my laptop again, um, a, a, an exercise which I think is interesting if you are interested in double negation elimination. Okay. Um, that's this, yeah. Any questions regarding these couple examples or any other questions? My plan would be to, um, as soon as the questions um, uh, are over to explain uh, or to give like the formal definition of this piece here in the theory. But first your questions, do I have some? Okay, good. Then let me explain the left-hand side of the theorem, the assumption, namely that there's a proof of the statement phi um, with a means of hiding arithmetic. Yeah? Um, okay, so what is HI? HA is a foundational system uh, for uh, working with natural numbers. It's the intuitionistic cousin of PA, piano arithmetic. Um, and it uh, has the following at ax axioms and what's the language? Um, the language of HA is the following. 
we have a constant for the number zero. We have an operation S for successor. And we have um, uh, addition and multiplication. Um, and, and that's it. That's the language of HA. And the axioms are the following. I will not write down all of them right now, but um, for instance, one of the axioms states um, um, x plus zero equals x, more precisely for all x, x plus zero equals x, or um, for all x and for all y, x plus s of y equals s of x plus y, and so on, a couple more regarding multiplication, and then um, uh, infinitely more, uh, namely the induction scheme. At some point when doing the exercises, we will need a precise list of all the axioms. You find these on Wikipedia. We don't need a full precise list right now. These are the axioms of HA. And then we also have logical rules embedded into HA, uh, rules which we may use in order to um, uh, obtain new statements from earlier ones and from the axioms. And I compiled the rules of HA uh, in the exercise sheet. I will bring that up in a second when you're done Copying. And this will again be a situation where I think some of you are quite familiar with those rules and others of you have never seen them. So here are the rules. Um, you go on, on our mini course web page, click on exercise sheets, and uh, then the exercise loads. And here you see the realizability semantics again. And there you see the rules of heighting arithmetic, which are just the general rules of intuitionistic predicate calculus, here written in the Gensen style sequent calculus fashion. There are also, also other presentations of, um, of more or less the same list of rules. Um, to those of you who are not familiar with that notation, let me explain. Um, for instance, this rule down below states that in the context of one free variable X, we may conclude the following. We may conclude that top and tails that X equals X. This uh, symbol here is pronounced as turnstile, and its meaning in this situation is entails. The idea is that to the left of the turnstile, we write down our assumption, and to the right of the turnstile, we write down our conclusion. So this states that with a trivial assumption top, in this style, I'm forced to write something to the left of the turnstile, hence I write top. Under the assumption top, we may conclude x equals x. By this rule, just saying, that top entails x equals x is a valid HI, HA proof. Let's have a look at one further rule. For instance, this one. This states that under the assumption phi and psi, we may conclude phi. Phi and psi entails, as a special case, phi. The index says vector x, which is just an abbreviation for x1, x2, x3, and so on until xn, by which I mean all the free variables appearing um, um, in those formulas so that I can even write down this sequence. This rule here at the right is an example for a more interesting rule or more complex rule than the others because it has preconditions. Um, I mean, this looks like a fraction and to the top of the fraction, we list the preconditions. And then 
uh, at the bottom of the fraction, we list um, what we may do in case, or what we may infer in case the preconditions are met. So this states, if we are already given a proof that phi entails psi, and if we are also given a proof that phi entails chi, then we may combine those two in order to obtain a proof that phi entails psi and chi, the conjunction. This rule explains um, what we need to do in order to prove a conjunction under some assumption phi. Namely, we need to uh, give two subproofs, a proof of psi and a proof of chi. Okay, uh, a final example, this one. Um, this has a double rule to it, which means that this rule can be applied from top to bottom as before, but also from bottom to top. From top to bottom, it explains um, how, what needs to be done in order to prove that under some assumption phi, this here holds. Namely, what we need to do is we need to prove psi, but in the enlarged context of an additional variable y. This rule uh, justifies the informal mathematical practice of doing the following. If you want to prove for all y psi holes, where most likely in the psi somewhere the variable y occurs, yeah? To, in order to prove that we do the following, we, we, we write let y be arbitrary. So we have introduced a new variable. And then we go on to prove, to prove psi for, for that y, for that variable y. Okay, these are the rules of, uh, uh, of first order intuitionistic predicate logic written up in Gensen's sequent calculus style. When I first learned them, I was quite astonished that with just this short list of rules and perhaps additionally the law of excluded middle, uh, we can formalize almost all of mathematics. So when you're first exposed to mathematics, you believe that a proof is a document in English or Italian or whatever, which has the purpose of convincing the reader. In particular, as long as it convinces the reader, the a proof can use make use of any words in English or Italian, any concepts, anything. But then it turns out that almost all of mathematics can be formalized using just this short list of rules, together with the axioms of heighting arithmetic or the axioms of ZFC or whatever. You just need a couple of rules, a couple of axioms, and then you can formalize almost all of mathematics. Not all of mathematics, you know that there are limits to that. You know the Bilbo's incompleteness theorem. Uh, you also know perhaps that there are some results in category theory, which cannot be formalized in ZFC, stuff like that. But almost all of mathematics can be formalized using very, a very small list of axioms and rules. Okay, why is that important or how will we use that? Um, we use that for, well, for making precise sense of the theorem and then for proving the theorem. Let me state the general idea of the proof and we will then actually carry out parts of the proof um, later on in the tutorial session. But let me give you the idea. Um, here's a, uh, and to get you the idea, I will write down a related theorem. If HA verifies phi, then phi is true in some informal sense. How would I prove this? I would prove that as follows. I would say by inspection, the axioms of HA are all true. Yeah, this stuff. And the rules of HA preserve truth. That is how I would how I would prove that. What I mean by saying that the rules of HA preserve truth. Well, for instance, if, um, if I convinced myself that um, phi implies psi, and if I also convinced myself that phi implies psi, then yes, indeed, it is true that phi implies the conjunction of both. 
Huh? These rules make sense. This here is the so-called semantic argument for the consistency of heighting arithmetic. Heighting arithmetic is consistent because something much stronger holds, namely what heighting arithmetic proves is true. Bottom is not true, hence heighting arithmetic is consistent. This proof can be carried out in English. It can also be carried out in strong meta theories like um, um, the middle of rental set theory or constructive cousins. But it cannot be carried out in heighting arithmetic or piano arithmetic itself because that would be a contradiction. How does the proof of soundness uh, work? It works as follows. Um, by inspection, but now this requires a closer inspection than before. Uh, the axioms of HA are all realized and the rules of HA preserve realizability. That is what we will need to prove like in the tutorial session or whenever, never perhaps if you just trust it, but it's extremely instructive to have to actually go through this proof in detail. And you really, really learn a lot about the relationship between proving and programming if you carry out the details of that proof. Let me, uh, because we want to go to lunch, let me just write down one quick example. Um, uh, one part of this. So for instance, we have, um, we have that rule at the top, top right. It's the so-called cut rule. Okay. Um, why does this preserve realizability? Let's check. So given a realizer for this entailment, that will be a program which turns with a realizers for phi into real realizers for psi. And given a realizer for that entailment, so a program for turning realizers for psi into realizers for chi. How can we then obtain a realizer for this entailment? A program which reads a realizer for phi is input and outputs a realizer for chi. How do we do that given realizers for those two? Excuse me, can you share the screen in Zoom, please? By composing the programs, that's exactly the right answer. We just compose this program with that program. The combined program will then be a program which reads in a realizer for phi's input, feeds that into the first program to obtain a realizer for psi, feeds that output as the input to the second program. This turns that input into a realizer for chi, and that is the final result we output. So the fact in logic that we can combine subproofs in this manner corresponds to the fact in computability that we can combine programs, that we can compose functions, com compose programs with each other. That is a reason. And similar computability reasons exist for all the other rules here and also for the axioms. That is how we prove the soundness theory. Okay. Good, let's stop here. Um, because I bet we are hungry and want to uh, have lunch. I will take all the questions over lunch. We meet. Okay, let's continue. My plan for this afternoon session would be to tackle a variety of topics. Um, I would like to start just as a warm up uh, with uh, one of the exercises regarding constructive mathematics, regarding minima of natural numbers and then turn to realizability again. Uh, have a look at that, at that very central uh, proof of the central theorem of this course, the soundness proof, uh, do a couple of examples there, do a couple of extensions, stuff like that. And then tomorrow we will talk about how to extract constructive content from classical proofs. First, the thing about the minima. So this will be exercise, um, 1.6c. Uh, 1. I would like to do 1.6c. Which states the following. 
if every inhabited, which I will abbreviate like that, if every inhabited set of natural numbers contains a minimum, then lem. And I would like to do this exercise because I think it, uh, uh, it illustra illustrates a couple of points in constructive mathematics quite well. So when approaching this theorem, you might uh, first wonder, let me just open up the chat, good. Okay, thank you, Alessandro, for your confirmation. Um, when approaching this theorem, you might first wonder why such a simple statement as the statement that every inhabited set of natural numbers contains a minimum, well, why this simple statement should imply the law of skew in middle at all. It doesn't seem like some hairy business uh, with real numbers, for instance. It's also not something about the halting problem or stuff like that. It's just sets of natural numbers. Why doesn't every set of natural numbers contain a minimum? And indeed, many sets of natural numbers do contain uh, a minimum. For instance, the set of prime numbers does, the set of even numbers, the set of odd numbers, and more generally, um, every detachable set of natural numbers does. Um, yeah, but from this theorem, you, um, you can see that if lem is not available, you will not be able to prove that every inhabited set of natural numbers does. And that is what I would like to explain. The proof will not be long. It will certainly fit on this tiny piece of blackboard. Um, so let's try to prove lem. So let an arbitrary arbitrary proposition P be given. We want to show P or not P. A non-trivial statement in constructive mathematics. And to this end, I will now write down a certain subset of the natural numbers, which will definitely be inhabited. And then by assumption, it contains a minimal element. And that is exactly what will give us either P or not P. Okay. Um, I will consider the following subset. So it definitely contains the number one, but it's not yet done. Because it definitely contains the number one, we can be sure that it's inhabited. But now I will add a little bit more to it. Namely, I will add the number zero to it. However, I will do that if and only if P holds. This notation is a little bit weird. It's acceptable in sub theory, but it's a little bit weird because ordinarily you put a variable name there and then have the condition to the right of that bar refer to that variable. Um, if you want this variable to be there at all cost, we can do that. I can reformulate that slightly. It can say, well, it's the set of all those natural numbers, which are zero and validate P. Okay, now the variable is there. Still, it's a little bit weird um, because that P here is a fixed proposition. Um, it's not some formula containing N. It's weird to write this down. A classical mathematician would just do a case distinction on the outset and will say, will say well, either P is false. Okay, then I wouldn't need to deal with that subset because it's just empty. Or P is true, in which case it's redundant to say and P, so that this will just be the singleton set containing zero. Okay, but constructively, uh, we cannot always carry out this case distinction. Hence, uh, this is some unspecified truth value, and we write down this subset. Um, this here is an abbreviation for that here. So I mean exactly the same thing. 
that's a subset of natural numbers and it's certainly um, inhabited by the number one. So now by assumption, it has a minimal element. By assumption, there's a minimum, um, let's call that M0 in X. And now I do a case distinction regarding whether N0 is the number zero or whether it's not the number zero. I will continue to write here in a second. And the other case will be this. Perhaps you are objecting at that point in the proof and saying, well, you are doing a case distinction here that's forbidden in constructive mathematics. And you would have a point if you raised that objection because in constructive mathematics, unlike in classical mathematics, we cannot generally carry out case distinctions. For doing that in the general case, we need the law of still the middle, stating P or not P for any P. But this is not a general situation. Here, I'm specifically asking whether a given natural number is equal to zero or not. I'm not asking whether there are infinitely many prime twins or not. I'm not asking whether the continuum hypothesis holds or not. I'm not asking whether a certain Turing machine terminates or not. I'm just asking whether this number is equal to zero or not. And it turns out that in conservative mathematics, we can prove that any given number is zero or not zero. It's related to the fact that we can write a program for determining whether a given number is zero or not. I will also supply a proof, constructive proof of this fact in a second. But first, uh, let's uh, conclude this proof. If n0 is 0, then in particular, 0 is an element of x. So 0 needs to be contained in here or in there. It certainly is not contained in here because this contains the number 1. So it needs to be contained in here, hence p holds. If you are given an element of this set, then you know that this condition holds. So then you know that the element is zero and that p holds. Most often or ordinarily in generic mathematics, when you are given an element of a set, um, you you also know that some condition holds. Perhaps if you're given an element of this of prime numbers, then you know that your number is prime. Okay, but ordinarily you will not know, learn some external fact. But here, this, this happens, yeah? Uh, we are, if we know that zero is contained in X, it's not contained here, so it's contained here. Um, um, and um, hence we know that this condition is satisfied and hence we learn that P holds, even though P is unrelated to um, X or the minimum or whatever. Um, so P. Um, and I just noticed that I, I used sloppy language just before I said that zero cannot be contained here, hence it's contained here. That sounded a little bit too classical to my, uh, to my ears after I reflected on that. Let me state it again. This time, you being careful in my language. If zero is an element of x, then we know that it's an element of here or of here. If it's an element of here, then we deduce that zero equals one, which is a contradiction to basic axioms of fighting arithmetic. And from this contradiction, anything follows. In particular, p follows, because in constructive mathematics we still have the x falsum quad libet which states from a false statement, every statement whatsoever follows. That's one of the rules of proposition uh, um, logic, also intuitionistic proposition logic. Okay, so in this case, we are done. And then in the second case, we know this ends P. Okay, and in this situation, in the case that the minimum is not zero, then I claim that we can show not P 
how do we show not p? We show not p by assuming p and deriving a contradiction. And that's a valid figure of proof in constructive mathematics because we are just using it for verifying a negative statement. Okay, how, uh, so let's do that. Assume p. So if p ho would hold, then um, this condition would simplify simply to saying n equals zero. Hence, then x would contain one and also zero. And hence the minimum would be zero, but it's not. Then not p because p would imply x equals zero one and hence n zero equals zero, which is a contradiction. So p or not p. And now you also have an idea why this principle that every inhabited set of natural numbers contains a minimum, why this fails. That's not so much about minima or natural numbers. Instead, it's about the flexibility of sets. Because like this set, while it's acceptable to write that down in, in most um, um, set theories, in most uh, also intuitionistic set theories, um, it's, it's a little bit of a weird set. It definitely contains one, but it contains zero if and only if p holds. So there's no, no algorithm for checking which numbers are actually contained in X. So it's a fishy set. And this fishy set is what breaks that minimum principle. Any questions, comments? Let's prove this lemma that every natural number is zero or not. Just to see that we can do that. Lemma for every number n, n is zero or n is not zero. Proof. So in classical logic, we would say, just say, well, it's an instance of lem and call it a day. Constructively, we need to invest more work. Do you have an idea which technique of proof we could use? Yeah, in Acta, we could do that, but I cannot do it on a blackboard. A contradiction. At some time, at some point, the word contradiction will appear. But if I start out with a with um, um, with putting my proof as a proof of contradiction, then I will not be able to to prove this goal because that is a positive goal. It's that it doesn't start out with a negative with a negation. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. But if any proof by contradiction will first and foremost only prove that something is not not true. And then we would need an additional lemma to go from this to what we actually want. Um, and that's more or less exactly what we want to show here. So it was a good attempt, but it doesn't quite work out. Unless I've misunderstood. Okay, yeah, try again. Yeah, so you're right, we can prove the following. N cannot be zero and non-zero at the same time. This is something we can prove. And by the way, it's unrelated to natural numbers. We can just prove in complete generality um, that it cannot be the case that um, P and its negation hold. However, I don't see how we get from any of these to that. Do you know some other proof technique which you often use for dealing with natural numbers? 
By induction. Let's do an induction proof. By induction. By induction on N. So an induction proof has, um, uh, has a beginning. Um, um, how do you call it in English? Um, base case. Okay. Base case n equals zero. Okay, so now we need to check in this case that n is zero or that n is non-zero. Well, it's zero. So in particular, it's non-zero. Okay. And by the way, um, this step the step where we said, well, it's zero, hence in particular, it's zero or non-zero, is justified by one of the rules of logic, namely by um, this one. This states under the uh, assumption phi, we may conclude phi or psi. Okay. Now the inductive step. Where we may use the induction hypothesis that N Um, well, we do this as follows. We ignore the induction hypothesis and just conclude that n plus one is certainly not zero. Then n plus one is not zero. It's an axiom of Heiting arithmetic that the successor of any number is not zero. Um, so in particular, n plus one equals zero or n plus one does not equal zero. Hence, better. That is one of the rare cases where uh, an induction proof is correct, even though at no point we have used the induction hypothesis. Usually, if an induction, induction proof does not use the induction hypothesis, either there's an error, or we could have just made without induction and put up a direct proof. But here, it's an example where we actually need it. Okay, and we could now extract from this constructive proof a program which will actually carry out this uh, uh, decision procedure, which will uh, read a natural number as n is input and output zero or uh, output yes or no, depending on whether n is zero or not. And you will see in a, more, in a couple of moments that because this proof is organized by induction, the resulting program will be organized as a recursive program. What's induction in proofs corresponds to recursion in programs. Okay. Good. But just as a warm up to exercises in constructive mathematics, now my plan would be to go back to where we left off uh, in the morning and uh, tackle realizability. Uh, do you have any questions, comments, ideas? Let's check the internet. Um, ah, yeah, I forgot to share the screen over Zoom. Um, sorry, Alessandro, I only saw it now. Um, and I also will not do it right now because I will use the blackboard. <clears throat> Alessandro, I displayed the rules of intuitionistic predicate calculus, which you find on our webpage if you go on exercises and then have a look at the first page of exercise sheet um, two. Okay. Um, and speaking of those rules, I would now like um, 
to do a further demonstration of using these rules because I would, uh, so my plan is to um, discuss this. Okay, now, now let me share the screen. Um, my plan is to to explain this sound theorem in more detail. Um, it, it, that's important to me because the title of this course is how to extract programs from proofs. And that is exactly the answer to that question. From a proof, we obtain a program. Uh, that is really the core of the course and hence I want to spend some time with it. And uh, because not all of you are familiar with like heighting arithmetic and formal proofs, I want to do an example. Um, so for instance, um, I would like to prove um, the following. I would like to prove that alpha and beta implies beta and alpha. So I want to verify the commutativity of conjunction. It's not a deep theorem, not at all. It's just um, an example for, um, um, for, for learning how to write up proofs in this particular style. I'm not advocating that you use this style when doing your proofs. Um, I am, in fact, I'm quite fine with English or with actor code, yeah? um, but it's important to do this exercise once in order to see how, how the rules work. Yeah? Okay, so under no particular assumption, under the assumption top, I want to verify that. And I think I need to stop the screen share so that the online participants um, can see the blackboard. Good. Okay, so let's use one of the rules. Uh, and one of the rules, let me, uh, I think I can display them at least to you and all the others can open up the exercise sheet and see them in that fashion. So um, there is the center double rule for implication. And that is exactly what we will need as our first step we want to prove a contradiction here, uh, an implication there. And um, yeah, this rule tell, tells us what we need to do in order to do that. We need to verify this. So the proof will grow to the top. Um, in total, we will uh, paint a proof tree. And unlike most trees in computer science, this is like an, a natural tree from outside, which grows to the top. Let's interpret what we have been doing here. So down below, we wanted to prove under the assumption top that this implication holds. And up there, we are doing something similar but different. Now we have a larger assumption. Our, our global assumption now is top and alpha and beta. And under this assumption, we want to prove beta and alpha. Okay, um, how do we prove beta and alpha? There's again a rule for that, um, namely this one the rule in the second row and fourth column, in order to prove under some assumption that a conjunction holds, we need to give two subproofs. So we need to give a subproof that this assumption entails alpha, that's the right subproof, and then also a left subproof. Okay, and now let's see how we can do that. 
Um, I think that will be with one of um, those rules. Um, so, um, let me argue as follows. I will in a second justify why we have this and why we have that. But taking that for granted for a second, we can now apply the rule at the top right corner. It's called the cut rule to carry out the step from there to there, right? Because here we showed under this assumption, some auxiliary lemma and then using this auxiliary lemma as assumption, we proved alpha. Okay, combining that, cutting out the auxiliary lemma, we obtain what we wanted. So this is an application of the cut rule, of the rule at the top right. Okay, and now we need to justify uh, those two. Um, this here um, is now completed. Uh, it's now a correct and complete proof tree. I'm using the rule in the second row and second column, this one here, alpha and beta entails alpha. And here I'm also using one of the rules. I'm using the rule in the second row and third column. So that is this. And in a similar fashion, you can complete the left branch of the proof. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ah, from the here to there. Yeah. Um, so from this to this. Um, it's the application of the cut rule, this rule, uh, first row, third column. Um, yeah, pattern match on that, yeah, like mentally, we have phi, the assumption here and also there. Then entailment, then some auxiliary statement, which will not appear down there. Then the same auxiliary statement, then entailment, and then some final statement, which then also occurs here. Yeah? It's a cut rule. The cut rule is what allows us in mathematics to, um, uh, to disentangle proofs by first proving some auxiliary statement and then going onwards from that auxiliary statement. Very important proof technique. We use it all the time without um, reflecting on that fact. Okay, so that is how a fully formal proof in the language of that sequent calculus can look like. And if you have never seen this kind of proof before, um, then I invite you to do a couple more exercises of your own choosing, just pick your favorite tautology, um, perhaps one of these, but uh, of exercise 1.3, but also perhaps some other tautology, uh, simpler ones, not involving negation, and try to prove them um, in this style, just so that you get the confidence that indeed these rules here are not um, at all arbitrary, but like carefully crafted to support the kind of reasoning we are used to carry out in blackboard mathematics. Yeah. When I first encountered these rules, I, I wasn't sure how I should be sure that there's no rule missing there, right? It's, it's just a couple of rules, perhaps one important rule is missing. Um, and you can never be really sure because like what's, what's an accepted mathematical argument is a social question and perhaps someday the mathematical community will accept English language texts, which right now would not be accepted as valid proofs. 
And hence, perhaps, indeed, this needs to be enlarged. Okay, but that's more a philosophical, like, fringe issue. Um, the fact is, um, any proof I ever encountered in my life um, can certainly be a cast in that language, assuming that it's a first order proof and not higher order proof making use of dependent types or whatever, then I need uh, appropriate modifications of these rules. But if it's like a first order situation, these proofs will be exactly what I need. And let me perhaps also say that um, uh, those rules um, come in clusters. Um, so for instance, all those rules on the second row are related to uh, conjunction. Um, this is called conjun conjunction elimination on the left, conjunction elimination on the right, and this is conjunction introduction because it tells us how to introduce a, a, con a conjunction. Um, this is called disjunction introduction on the left, on the right, and this is disjunction elimination. Um, yeah, and then this is a double rule regarding implication, double rules regarding the quantifiers, then two rules regarding equality, and then up there a couple of so-called structural rules uh, necessary in some cases to have a, like a beginning, phi entails the same phi, then we can carry out substitutions. That is what is meant by these uh, square brackets. And then the all, uh, already mentioned cut rule. Okay. Any questions, comments, issues regarding that? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, perhaps a fun fact about the cut rule, because we mentioned it again. Um, in many situations, one can prove that, in fact, the cut rule is not necessary in the sense that a given proof, which might make use of the cut rule lots of times, can be transformed into a new proof, which then doesn't use the cut rule. That is called, this procedure or this theorem is called cut elimination. It doesn't hold for all kinds of formal systems, but for many. For instance, it holds for PA, piano arithmetic. Um, I think uh, um, that, that's quite insightful. It tells you in some sense that um, uh, if, you, if you invest the proper amount of work, then you will never need auxiliary statements you can prove everything directly in one go. Uh, of course, that would not match how we humans think, yeah? but it, theoretically it's possible. And there's one big uh, thing to note about cut elimination, namely cut elimination um, blows up the size of the proof, the proof massively. So a very short proof, which uses cut a couple of times, uh, gets transformed using cut elimination to a very, very, very long proof, which then doesn't use cut elimination. Uh, in fact, the, the procedure for eliminating cuts, so for reformulating a given proof so that it does no longer use the cut rule in the first row, third column, um, um, that is more or less a constructive proof. It's an explicit procedure. Um, however, to ensure that this procedure terminates instead of being trapped in an infinite loop um, requires ordinary numbers and it requires order numbers of, uh, of, uh, of a certain size. So not, not only the smallest kinds of order numbers. For instance, uh, to prove that cut elimination is possible for piano arithmetic, um, we need order numbers um, up to, but excluding epsilon zero, which was omega to the omega to the omega to the omega to the omega. Yeah? So quite a substantial ordinal. And for stronger systems, we need larger ordinals in order to carry out the cut elimination. And in fact, you can carry, uh, you can measure the strength of a formal system by comparing the order number required in order to prove that cut elimination works. Yeah? And then it turns out that PA has that epsilon zero, 
And uh, for instance, for ZFZ, Samuel Frankel with the axiom of choice, the standard foundation of mathematics or so they say, the ordinary is so big that currently we are lacking technology to describe that ordinary. Uh, it, it blows everything out of proportion. Yeah. 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 Without, if, if ACTA would not allow cut elimination, so if ACTA would not allow composition of functions, yeah, then almost any proof which you would like to enter into ACTA would be of enormous size. Yeah. So, like one page of English argument would transfer to one billion pages of ACTA code if uh, the cut rule was not allowed. Okay. Okay. Um, now let's turn to this, that theorem. This here, the soundness theorem. And I will share the screen again. Good. Um, my plan would be to um, prove a couple of those cases, not all of them. It's also very, very instructive to do them on your own, but I would like to guide you through a couple of those cases so that you get a feeling for that. Because as I said, it's the most important theorem of the course. It tells us how to extract a program from a proof. Um, to do that, I first have a question to you, namely, do you have any questions or concerns regarding these rules, this realizability semantics. Because now would be a good time to ask those questions. You can also ask later, but now would be a especially suited time. Okay, then let's, let's try. Huh? Um, Good. Okay, um, we already started the proof. That was that short amount of time you missed. Um, sorry, the chat is not visible. Good. Um, the idea is the following. We check that all the axioms of Heiting arithmetic are realized. And then we check that all the rules of Heiting arithmetic preserve realizability. Um, so we need one case for all the axioms of HA and we need one case for all the rules of um, intuitionistic predicate logic. Let's just do a couple. Um, let's start out uh, with the following. Um, for instance, uh, let's consider the following rule. Um, which one um, is suitable? Um, let's pick this one. Yeah, just for starters. Okay. Okay, so that's a rule of logic. It states that under the assumption phi and psi, we may conclude phi. Um, and to apply this rule, uh, no preconditions need to be met because uh, what's in the top of the fraction is nothing. Um, um, so I'm claiming that uh, this is also realizable. 
So let's check that it's realizable that this holds phi and psi implies phi. The general idea will be that for any rule of intuition the predicate logic, we prove that uh, the conclusion of that rule is realizable where we translate the turnstile into, an, into a proper implication. So what do we need to do? So we need to find a natural number E such that, and now I check the definition of implication uh, of uh, the semantics of implication this year. So we need to check that uh, find a number e such that for every r in n with the property that r um, realizes phi and psi, it holds that e times r terminates and e times r should terminate not with some arbitrary value, but with a realizer for phi. That is our goal. So how to do that? Do you have a suggestion? Let me also um, show you the definition of conjunction again. Conjunction and implication so that you have everything on the screen. Yeah. 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 Preserve, preserve realizability, not truth. Right. Briefly, we discussed truth because as a warm-up to that theorem, I wanted to prove the following. If heighting arithmetic proofs are formula, then phi is true. Um, and that is uh, that we did in this manner. But now I want to prove the soundness theorem, which states if heighting arithmetic proofs are formula, then that formula is realized. And by the way, um, um, Perhaps this is confusing to, to many of you. Um, this year is an abbreviation for there is an HA proof of uh, the sequent top entails phi. So if you just say heighting arithmetic entails something, proves something, then we mean that using the axioms and rules of heighting arithmetic it's possible to construct a proof tree like we had on the blackboard, um, where the conclusion of the proof tree is the sequent top entails phi, where top is the trivial true statement. Yeah, that is something which we need to do, check, yeah. Exactly. No. And for fun, I decided to start with that rule. Perhaps it would be uh, more correct to start with the axioms. Uh, but for fun, I decided to start with, uh, with this particular rule. A great question. It's, it's very important that, um, that we arrive at a good understanding of this uh, theorem. So let's check again. Let's think about that. Um, why is it that this statement is realized? How does a realizer of this statement look like? The requirement is that for every number R, which happens to be a realizer for that, E should terminate, the E3 machine should terminate when applying R to it in such a way that the resulting value is a realizer for phi. And recall what it means that R realizes phi and psi. 
He has written what this means. It means that R is a Turing machine, or we can picture R to be a Turing machine by looking up in the list of all Turing machines, the position at index R, in such a way that um, a first component can be extracted from that Turing machine, and also a second, such that the first component is a realizer for phi, and such so that the second component is a realizer for psi. So what should we use for E? Yes. Pi one is exactly the name of the Turing machine, which reads a pair as input and com computes its first component, right? right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Okay, and I want to stress that every single case of that proof we are currently doing um, gives us some philosophical insight as to the connection of proofs and computation. Here the insight is the following. The fact in logic that we can carry out this kind of argument that from phi and psi, we may follow, we may conclude phi. It's also called weakening, yeah, because we forget a little bit of the assumption. Corresponds to the fact that in computer science, we can extract the first component of a pair. Let's do another rule. If you have a particular suggestion, then say so, else I will pick one at random. And of course, you can also ask questions regarding that rule. Um, here they are. Um, let's pick this rule. Okay. And pre prepared that you will learn some philosophical insight about the connection between con uh, proofs and computation. Namely, you will learn what the computational content is of this kind of argument, that of x files and quad yeah. Now let's consider the rule from uh, nothing. As, under no as, um, uh, assumptions conclude uh, conclude that, that the following thing is provable, bottom entails phi. Yeah. We need to find a realizer, E, such that E realizes this implication. Okay, so what does it need, uh, what does it need to do? Um, spelled out or hence um, E needs to satisfy the following. Um, for every R in N such that um, R realizes bottom in any of that situation, E times R should terminate and E times R should uh, terminate with a realizer for phi. That is what we need to do. Okay, which computer program you know has this property? Given a number R as input with that property, 
um, E times R should terminate with some realizer for phi. Right, by definition, there's no realizer for the bottom. So this here can never happen, right? So. Which E could be used. Yeah. Not quite. You are definitely on track, but not quite. We don't need to write down a machine which like fails. No, also not. What's your favorite number? What's your favorite number? Zero, okay. Zero will work. 42 would have also worked. Let's check. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. So I, I don't really know which machine in that list of altering machines is at position 42, okay? Because we never fixed the precise ordering of those uh, machines. But I know that the 40, 42th machine will satisfy this requirement because given any number r such that r realizes bottom, which can never be the case, if you have a look at the definition, right? Okay, given that situation, which is impossible, then applying R to the 42th Turing machine re results in a realizer for fun. That is correct. We can pick any program whatsoever because that program needs to uh, be able to come up with a realizer phi only in impossible situations. But, but, but this impossible situation will never happen. So the, the program can chill. So what's the computational content of this logical rule? Um, there is no computational content. No? Any, any number whatsoever is a valid realizer for this entailment. I think it's a little bit similar also in logic, right? Because, um, I mean, what's the, so if, if, you have, if you have proven that, then you will not get the fields medal. If, if you have proven that, you will not get the fields medal. You will not get any medal. You will not get any status in the mathematical community, mathematical community because from bottom, Everything follows. You cannot say, oh, look at me. I proved that bottom implies Fermat's loss theory because bottom entails anything, thanks to that rule. Yeah? Let's do one more. Um, perhaps uh, one final uh, uh, rule of this list of rules and then one of the axioms of hiding arithmetic. Do you have a favorite? else I will pick um, this one here. Okay, this is one is a little bit more complex because it has preconditions. Okay, good. Now let's, and then we will do with something else, yeah? Now let's con consider the rule Okay, phi entails chi and psi entails chi. So that is uh, uh, subproofs which are already given. And from this, the rule produces a new proof of this statement. 
Now let's first check that this rule makes sense, informally speaking, using mathematical English. This tells us that um, if you want to prove this, that phi or psi entails chi, then it's enough to give two subproofs, namely a subproof of this claim and a subproof of that claim. And indeed, informally speaking, that rule is justified because if our assumption is phi or psi, well, then either phi or psi or both. Okay, and in case phi hold, holds, we can use that subproof in order to conclude chi. And in case psi holds, we can use the other subproof in order to conclude chi. So this, this rule does make sense, informally speaking. Um, and now let's check that it is realized. Okay. More precisely, to check that this rule is realizability preserving. So um, uh, given um, a machine R, uh, given E and F such that E realizes phi implies chi and such that F realizes psi implies chi, uh, we need to construct uh, a number G a machine G such that G realizes this implication. Okay, we are given realizers for uh, the conclusions of those two subgroups. And now, well, now we need to construct a realizer for the grand conclusion. So let's have a look at what the rule of this junction means. And let's think about what G needs to do. G reads as input a realizer for this disjunction. And then it should output a realizer for chi. G reads as input a realizer for this junction, and it should output a realizer for chi. How should G do that? Uh huh. And should it use E or should it use F? Uh huh. Great question. Um, it's almost correct. The thing is, um, a machine in general cannot check whether a given number is really a realizer for a certain statement. Uh, because that might require checking infinitely many cases and an ordinary Turing machine cannot do that. But, uh, but in this case, we don't need to do any guessing. Yeah? yeah, but how do we know which one to choose? It's related by the way to um, what, what you've been asking um, uh, last time. So recall how a realizer for a disjunction looks like. Um, yeah, yeah, right. So a realizer for a disjunction um, is something which validates that, right? So we can apply pi one to the given input realizer uh, to learn whether it's pi one of that is zero or not zero. In this case, we know that um, pi two applied to the input will be a realizer for phi. And using that realizer for phi, we can input that into E to obtain a realizer for chi as, as wanted. And if P1 applied to the input is non-zero, well then, then we use F. Then we put a feed pi two times E into F, which will then transform the realizer for psi into a realizer for chi. In both cases, we have obtained a realizer for chi. Okay. To summarize, 
we are given a realizer which will turn with realizers for pi into realizers for chi, and also another realizer, namely f, for turning realizers for pi into realizers for chi. And we can combine them into a realizer G for this implication. And we do that as follows. I will not write down anything. Um, the machine G operates as follows. It reads as input a realizer for this disjunction. Let's call that realizer R. Then it applies pi one to R. Uh, the result will be zero or it will be non-zero. If it's zero, then we as G know that um, our goal is to use E, or, or we need to use, or we need and can use E. Uh, we just feed into E a pi two times E. And if that result is non-zero, then we will feed into F P times times pi P two times R. In both cases, we will obtain a realizer of chi, and that is what we will output. Um, yes, indeed. And um, just to stress, because now we are concerned what, just with the question where, uh, whether there's a Turing machine which is capable of carrying out what we, uh, what we want to do, um, we wouldn't even need that proof from before. Uh, we just need to be confident in our Turing machine programming abilities that we are able to program a Turing machine which checks whether a number is zero or not. And that is possible. Of course, by the way, it depends how we encode natural numbers. Should we encode them as binary digits or should we uh, encode them in unary? So just like put 10 ones on the tape if you want to denote the number 10. Both approaches work. Now, at some point, we just need to stick one. And depending on which one we, we choose, um, uh, we then also mean by this zero, uh, the corresponding um, encoding of the number zero. Okay, let's do one final thing, um, not, re uh, not related to these rules, but related to the axioms. We didn't check any axiom. Let's check that induction is realized, okay? Um, now let's consider the following axiom uh, and the inductions axiom, which is in fact infinitely many axioms, one for each, uh, proposition P, that states the following. If P of zero holds, and if for all natural numbers, P of N implies P of suck N, P of N plus one, yeah, then for every natural number, P of N. That is the induction axiom. If you have the base case, and if we, if we have the induction step, then we may conclude P of N for all N. So let's check that this is realized. A realizer E for this axiom um, is a machine which and perhaps let's try to uh, not write anything, but just like discuss it uh, orally. A realizer for this implication yeah, would be a Turing machine, which reads as input, a realizer for that, and produces as output, a realizer for that. I get this from the clauses for implication up there. Now recall a realizer for a conjunction is in fact a pair of two realizers. We can apply pi one or pi two to it to obtain a realizer of the first conjunct, conjunct of P of zero and a realizer of the second conjunct. And now we just need to remember what's a realizer of a universal statement like this. Um, a number is a realizer for a universal statement if um, for any input whatsoever, for every natural number input, E times X terminates with 
a realizer for the corresponding formula phi of x. So what this machine E will need to do after having read its input is to output a new machine such that this new machine reads its input initial number and then outputs a realizer for P of n. Let's do a quick check, sanity check of a special case. Um, for instance, this new machine returned by E, um, how should that machine compute a realizer for P of zero? Right, by just applying pi one to the given realizer, awesome. How should the machine which uh, we return as E, the machine which should be a realizer of this universal statement, how should this machine compute a realizer for P of one? Not P of zero, but P of one. Right, because pi two of uh, pi two of this is a realizer for that. So this is a function which is a natural number as input, some n, and then outputs a machine which, which in turn reads a witness for a realizer for p of n as input and outputs a witness a realizer for p of s from s of n. So if we just feed into that a machine the number zero and then the given realizer for p of zero we obtain a realizer for p of one. And if we wanted uh, to obtain a realizer for p of two, we would do the following. Um, we feed this realizer into this machine to obtain a realizer for p of one. And then we feed that realizer again into this machine to obtain a realizer for p of two. In Haskell notation, it's the following. We have, uh, or more or less Haskell notation, we have base of p zero, and we have a step, which is a let's use actor notation, which um, has this signature, yeah? And then to obtain um, P of two, we do the following. We apply the step function like that. To obtain P of three, we do this. To obtain P of four, we do this. Let's rephrase that um, informal, in uninformal uh, terms. Um, so we are given a realizer for P of zero, a machine for, for which verifies, which um, witnesses P of zero. And we are given a machine which when input a realizer for p of n outputs a realizer for p of the next n. So by just using the second machine as often as needed, we thereby can obtain realizers for p of whatever number we want. And that is, by the way, also how we explain introduction uh, in um, induction to, um, to first year students, right? If, so if they are distrusting induction a little bit, uh, then we can do the following example. We can say to them something like, well, assume that you are unsure about whether P of four really holds. Then just do the following. Write down your base case again, thereby you have verified P of zero, and then append to your proof the induction step proof in the special case of N equals zero, in which case the induction step brings you from N equals zero to N equals one, and then append to your proof Again, the proof of the induction step, but now in this special case, n equals one, because in that case, it brings you from p of one to p of two, and then do that two more times in order to obtain it, to obtain p of four. Okay, and yeah, how to combine these results into a machine? We need recursion for that. And that is why what is induction in proofs corresponds to recursion in programs. Okay. Um, you will see here exercise 2.2, which asks you to do all the remaining cases. Um, 
Of course, that's a bit of work. And it's even more work if you formalize that in ACTA. Um, I will upload uh, a template this evening, probably. And then you can click here on that special icon and see the, uh, the, the, the template of the ACTA formalization. Uh, but it's very much instruct instructive. And if you want to like actually learn like the, uh, the details of how programs can be sort of improved, then I encourage you to do this exercise. Okay. Good. Any general questions, comments, ideas you might have? Else my plan would be to just tie up a couple of loose ends and then conclude. Would you appreciate a short break or shall we power through? Short break, awesome. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Five minutes, awesome. Then let's continue at uh, 17.15.
Okay, welcome back. Let's continue. Um, so the main takeaway message from uh, today's lecture is that there's a thing called realizability. A statement is realized if and only if there's a Turing machine witnessing that statement, where pre the precise meaning of witnessing that statement is given in that list of rules. And we have the so-called soundness theorem that from any proof in hiking arithmetic, we can extract a realizer. Okay. Um, and yeah, it turns out this is just the tip of a, of a huge iceberg. This is a tip of uh, an industry. Uh, there are people, uh, so there are computer scientists or mathematicians uh, who build all of their career just around variations of this theorem. Yeah? So it's really a, a great thing because you can vary both the notions of accepted programs. They don't need to be Turing machines. They can also be different kinds of programs or machines. And you can also vary the notion of proof here. Yeah. Hiding arithmetic was just a, a nice space, uh, space system. Um, in particular, I would like to do the following, uh, seeing that before uh, we had this bonus session on infinite time training machines. Um, let's discuss realizability for infinite time training machines. Yeah? And let's just do it informally. So we don't, we, we will not need to write down a pi one or something. Yeah. Um, here. Okay, um, uh, we already started with the table and we discussed whether things, uh, whether those statements are true in classical mathematics, which is here titled in the topos set, the standard topos. And uh, this column is titled um, with in the effective topos built using ordinary tuning machines. So, as briefly, very briefly mentioned already, toposes are alternate mathematical universe in which mathematics unfolds slightly different in comparison with the standard topos. Um, and one of the many toposes is called the effective topos. More precisely, the effective topos built using ordinary Turing machines. And even though this was not, of course, in topos theory, um, you are able to find out which statements hold in that alternative world of mathematics in that effective topos, because exactly those statements hold in the effective topos, which are realizable. Huh? So if you want to find out whether, for instance, every number is prime or not, whether this statement holds in the effective topos built using two machines, you just check whether it's realizable. In this case, it is, because there's a primality checker as a Turing machine. Um, I think that it's quite astounding that we as tiny human earth-based mathematicians can explore the mathematics of other universes. Of course, it's not like physical universes. We are not traveling to some like distant galaxy or physical parallel reality. We're just sitting here in Verona and, and uh, doing mind stuff. Um, but it has a similar feeling, a similar quality to me. Yeah? We can explore those other alternative universes because we know um, um, the, what it means that a statement is true in, an, in a certain alternative universe. And for the effective topos built using two machines, the meaning of a statement is exactly whether the statement is realizable. But we can also build the effective, effective topos using super Turing machines. So those infinite time Turing machines invented by perhaps several people, but um, more prominently by Joel David Hempkins and Andy Lewis. Um, the definitions for that are exactly the same, the realizability notions, except that everywhere where we wrote Turing machine, we now write super Turing machine. And then it turns out that some things are slightly different. And you see the first difference here. Consider the map, every map, uh, consider the statement, every map from n to n has a zero or not. So that's trivially true in classical mathematics because it's an instance of lamp. This statement is not realized by Turing machines because as a Turing machine, when somebody hands me 
uh, a Turing machine computing some, some function from n to n, then I don't have a chance of finding out with certainty whether this function will have a zero or not. I can simulate that other Turing machine in order to compute lots and lots of function values. And if I encounter a zero, then I can prove that it has a zero, awesome. Um, and I can also analyze the given Turing machine, the source code, and try to determine from looking at the source code whether the given function from n to n has a zero or not. But in general, I will not be able to come up with a definite conclusion. The situation changes drastically when we use super Turing machines. Here, the situation would be the following. We are a super Turing machine and we are given a super Turing machine computing some function from n to n. And now we need to find out whether that function has a zero or not. And the way how to do that is as follows. We simulate that super Turing machine on input zero, on input one, on input two, three, four, five, and so on. And then we just check whether at some point we have obtained a zero or not. Each individual simulation task, simulating the input Turing super Turing machine on input zero, one, two, three, might require more than infinitely many days, but that's okay. At some point, we will have checked all the possible inputs and thereby determined with certainty whether the input number, uh, whether the input function has a zero or not. Let's consider statement number four. Every map from n to n is computable. That is a wildly false statement in classical mathematics. There are many functions which are not computable. For instance, the halting function. Um, or also the busy beaver function. Do you know the, have you heard of the busy beaver function? It's a, it's a very fun function. Um, Um, so it's a certain function. Let me not uh, scroll to the uh, precise definition, but to its values. Um, busy beaver of n is the maximal number of steps a Turing machine with n states or less can carry out before eventually terminating. So it's easy to write down Turing machines which never terminate. But it's hard to write down Turing machines which do terminate, however, only do so after a long amount of time. And BB of n is the record. How many computational steps can you get while still terminating with using n states or less? And it turns out that the busy, uh, that the busy beaver function is extremely fast growing. Um, uh, there are several variants of the busy beaver function, uh, but let's just have a look at this. So BB of two is six, so there's two states. The most you can get um, is a two machine which requires six, which carries out six computation stops and then stops. BB of three is 21, 107, then already this number, and then 10, hyper, hyper 15. So 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10, a tower of 15 tens, yeah? extremely fast growing. Um, and fun fact, this busy beaver function is so extremely fast growing that there's a certain limit as to um, what you can prove about this function. It's not only an uncomputable function, it's also a function which transcends the boundaries of logic. Um, and I forgot right now, but yes, uh, a student of mine, um, uh, managed to prove the following, namely that um, ZFZ, even the mighty ZFZ, Zamilo Frankel with choice, strong classical meta theory, that even the mighty ZFZ is not able to verify any conjecture as to the uh, as to the value of BB of seven four eight. And before that was a bachelor thesis, and before this bachelor thesis, um, uh, we knew that ZFZ cannot verify any conjecture regarding BB of seven four nine. Yeah, and by lots of work as a bachelor student, very great, very nice work, he managed to lower that bound by, by one. Yeah? So the busy beaver function is definitely 
uh, an example for a function which from end to end which is not computable. However, this, as a statement, every map from end to end is computable, this statement is realized in ordinary realizability built from Turing machines. Uh, we already discussed that briefly in the morning session. Um, the reason is not because magically every function is computable, that's bogus. The reason is instead because, uh, because of the calling conventions. What this statement means is there's a Turing machine which reads a Turing machine which computes a function from end to end as input and outputs a Turing machine which computes that function. And that is trivial to do. Just echo the input back as output. What do you think appears here? So if we base our realizability on super Turing machines instead of ordinary Turing machines, will this statement be realized or not? And let me be more, more, let me be more precise. Uh, this statement says every map from end to end is computable by an ordinary Turing machine. That is that is right. However, it's not true that this is realized. At all. The reason is again because of the calling conventions. Um, so that statement number five is realized would mean there's a super Turing machine, which given a super Turing machine computing a map f from n to n outputs an ordinary Turing machine computing f. And that is not possible. Yeah, you're right. What an ordinary Turing machine can do, also a super Turing machine can do, but that's not of help here because we are given a super Turing machine as input and somehow would need to turn this super Turing machine into a Turing machine. It's exactly the other way around. Yeah. Also a super machine, yes, yeah. That is that is a calling convention of Yeah, yeah. In this yeah. yeah, in this special case, you would be right. However, in general, um, uh, like we as a as a super machine cannot trust on that, in the sense that um, well what what uh, in the following sense, a realizer, a super Turing realizer for statement number five would be a super Turing machine, which reads as input a super Turing machine computing some map from end to end, and then needs to output a realizer for the claim that this function is computable by an ordinary Turing machine, hence, which would need to output an ordinary Turing machine computing that function f. And that is something which you cannot do in general. Of course, if the given input super Turing machine happens to be an ordinary Turing machine, then yes, we can output an ordinary Turing machine computing the same function f by just echoing the input function input Turing machine back. But what, what if the input is an actual super Turing machine? Then we won't have any chance of doing that. Question, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right, yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It has a totally different semantics. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just noticed a typo on the slide, right? We have been referring to statement number four 
every map is computable, not five. But now let's turn to five. Every map from R to R is continuous. Um, so that is wildly false in classical mathematics. Here's an example for a discontinuous function. That's a discontinuous function. Okay, good. Not every function from R to R is continuous um, in classical mathematics. Surprisingly, in the, effect, in the standard effective topos, so in standard realizability, the realizability of to, today, today's morning lecture, it is in fact true that every function from R to, every function from R, to R is continuous, but it means something different now. What, I, what I'm just saying is that every, that this statement, that every map from R to R is continuous, that this statement is realized. If you wanted to check that yourself, you couldn't right now, because if you have a list of all the clauses for the realizability semantics, you would, would notice that I did not write down any clause for dealing with real numbers. And also I did not write, any, write down any clause for dealing with functions. Yeah? So two important ingredients missing. But I could extend the semantics. I just did, didn't do so for reasons of like simplicity. I could do that. And then you could check that indeed the statement is realized. Uh, but I still want to give you the intuition for that um, because I think that intuition can be appreciated even if you don't see the formal definition. The intuition is as follows. If, if we are a Turing machine, an ordinary Turing machine, and if we want to compute a function from R to R, then we will read as input a real number represented by a Turing machine, and we will output a real number again represented by a Turing machine. Um, what does it mean that a real number is represented by a Turing machine? It means that we can ask this Turing machine to give us better and better approximations to our real number. For instance, a real number uh, representing pi would be a Turing machine which outputs um, 3 um, or 3.1, 3.14, 3.141, and so on, depending on the input we give to the Turing machine. Okay. Now, here you have seen an example for a discontinuous function from R to R. How would you try to implement this function as a Turing machine? How would you try to implement this function in Python? It would start out as follows. Okay, and now you need to put Python code here, here which computes this function. So it should be minus one if x is smaller than zero, it should be zero. If x is zero, and it should be one. If x is more than zero, how would you do that? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. But does this actually work? With floating point numbers, it would work. But with actual real numbers, which are not available in Python, at least not in so Python does have libraries for exact computation with real numbers, but in standard Python you don't, in like in bare Python you don't have it, and then you cannot carry out this case distinction, because given an actual real number represented by a Turing machine which is able to produce more and more approximations, better and better approximations, you cannot find out with certainty whether the number is smaller than zero, equal to zero, or larger than zero. You don't have this if then else statement available. Yeah. If the, if, the, if the better and better approximations are like this 0 0.0, 0 0.00, 0 0.000, and so on, well, then you can expect that the number is zero, but that's not for sure. If a, a, a sufficiently fine approximation might, uh, might tell you that the number is in fact positive because it's 0 0.1 billion zeros and then a seven. Okay, quite a curious world in that effect purpose, every function from R to R is continuous. If, if, um, if there were undergraduates in this alternative purpose, they would probably never learn about continuity because there's no point in introducing a notion if every function satisfies the, uh, that, that uh, notion. What about the effective topos built using super machines? 
In other words, to keep things concrete, can we implement a super Turing machine which implements this function? Yes, now we can. Because now we can um, uh, just check all the better and better approximations of the input number. And thereby, after omega many days of computation, perhaps even more if the individual computations require more than a finite amount of uh, days, at some point we will be able to conclude with certainty whether the number is um, zero, less than zero or positive. Hence, we can carry out that if and else uh, uh, procedure. Hence, we can exhibit discontinuous functions. Hence, the statement is not realized. It's false in the effective purpose using super machines. Yes. Because for actual real numbers, you don't have, you cannot compute that if then else statement regarding whether a given number is exactly zero or not. For floating point numbers, you can. And by the way, in case you have ever attended a course on, say, numerical mathematics, perhaps the lecturer warned you to never compare two floating point numbers for equality. You can do that in Python. You can do that in any program language, not specific to Python. But it's almost always a sign that you're doing something wrong. Because recall with floating point, uh, with floating point numbers, we always have rounding errors. So um, if, you, if, if, you, uh, uh, if you carry out this check whether two given floating point numbers are the same, really the same, then um, then this check is highly sensitive to the rounding errors which occurred before. It might wrongly say, yes, they are the same, even though in actual, uh, actuality they shouldn't be. Or also the other way around, it might say uh, that they're not the same, but only because of some rounding errors which, which created that difference. Yeah? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I would say we have continuity, but it turns out that every function is continuous from the reals to the reals. We will not have this function in that alternative world. In the effective topos built using tree machines, ordinary tree machines, we don't, we'll, we will not have that function. You, in other words, you cannot implement that function on a tree machine. You can only implement approximations to that function Which, which look like this uh, here, and then a steep, but not vertical, a steep slope upwards, and then to the right again, you can uh, program that. Even if you just have a finite degree of, um, of accuracy in the input, you can still compute a function which proceeds uh, like this. But uh, for doing the actual sign function, um, you need, an infinite amount of precision in order to find out whether your given input number is precisely zero or not. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. The, no, there is, uh, uh, the, you cannot implement any discontinuous map, but you can implement lots of continuous maps. For instance, the identity function, which looks like this, you can definitely implement that by just inputting a number X and outputting X again. And you can also implement this squaring function X squared. Yeah, you can implement lots of functions, but not any discontinuous one. Um, Markov's principle, yeah, it's a certain logical principle which is available in classical mathematics. It's not available in constructed mathematics. And this, uh, what I mean here by that is that we have this check mark only if in our meta theory, we accept Markov's principle. I'm, uh, I'm being careful here because um, I don't want to force a classical meta theory upon you. Perhaps you would like you like constructive mathematics so much that you also declare that your meta theory 
which is which up to, up to now was informal classical English or Italian. Um, uh, but, but perhaps you would like your meta theory to be informal constructive English. And then I need to be very specific when I'm assuming MP and when I'm not. And MP is in fact a, a quite a fun principle. And um, uh, one exercise about MP is already included in the sheet and I will include a second one, which to my eyes is even more fun uh, later this evening. Um, let's do one final one, namely, um, yeah, perhaps just this. There's a principle called countable choice. I don't want to tell you what this is right now. Um, it's true in classical mathematics because even the full axiom of choice is true there. Countable choice is, a, uh, is, uh, is the little sister of the full axiom of choice. And uh, it's not provable in constructive mathematics, but still it's realizable in, uh, with Turing machines and also with super Turing machines. And I'm writing this always here to indicate that even if you don't accept uh, the axiom of countable choice in your meta theory, it still holds true in uh, the effective purpose and in the super effective purpose. Yeah? So sometimes an alternate, alternative mathematical universe can enjoy more properties than your surrounding universe. Okay, uh, final thing, just because it's so, so fun and so weird, um, here we have the claim that there's an injective function from the reals to the natural numbers. Recall there are many more reals than naturals. Saying that you have an injective function means you have a function from R to N such that, um, let me be a little bit sloppy and use classic logic in my paraphrasing, such that different real numbers are mapped to different outputs. Um, that is a hard task if the source set is larger, in this case, much larger than the target set. There are just countably many natural numbers to choose from, but uncountably many real numbers. Correspondingly, you can prove in classical mathematics that there is no injective function from the reals to the naturals. And uh, people wondered whether this proof can be constructivized. And they failed to constructivize it. And if you, if you fail to constructivize a result, this can mean any of two things. One is you haven't tried hard enough. Second is there is no constructive proof because um, there is, on the other hand, a certain topos in which that statement is not true. And that's, that is exactly the situation here. Um, so in the ordinary effective topos, one can still show that there's no injection from the reals to the naturals as it should be but in the effective purpose you built using super Turing machines, you can amazingly write down an injective function from the reals to the naturals. Um, the proof, uh, I, let's, let's not do the proof now, but if you're interested in that, the proof is contained here. I will also put a more specific link to that. Um, um, you click go on my website and you click on this paper, exploring mathematical objects from custom tailored universes. And um, then it's somewhere in here. Um, uh, here you have a similar table, yeah? And then a couple lines below, uh, I prove that. Okay. Um, good, that is... Uh, it's also on the next slide here, uh, but just not the actual Turing machine, just what to do. I will also link, uh, uh, link this set of slides. Um, ah, yeah, okay. I would like to tell you one more fun fact and then stop. Let phi be an arbitrary statement. And then let's compare it with the following statement. This, so here in the front, we have the claim that phi is true. And here we have the claim that phi is realizable. Um, do, we, do we have an implication? 
do we have perhaps this? Or do we perhaps have um, that? What do you think? Implication to the right, implication to the left, no implication at all. Yeah, the, uh, on the left, I just mean phi holds, yeah. And, then, and on the right, I mean phi is realized, yeah. Phi, yeah. So the left-hand side means phi is true, and the right-hand side means uh, there's a Turing machine realizing phi. <laughs> um, in the classical standard base topos, in classical mathematics. So even though this question is related to constructive mathematics and so on because of realizability, I'm now asking you as an audience of classical mathematicians for a second, um, does phi imply that phi is realized or the other way around, or do we not have any implication? Yeah. 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 Backwards direction, right? I think you wanted to argue this, right? You said, well, if I can even realize it by a Turing machine, then for sure it's true. Because I have much more than the mere truth. I have a realizer for it, a computational witness for it. Yeah. Indeed, indeed, very good point. Um, here, every map from end to end is computable. That is realizable, but not true. Okay, good. So this does not hold. Then perhaps this, this holds. Also not um, um, every map has a zero, is, uh, has a zero or not, is true, but not realizable. So, um, even though they are related, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Yeah? Uh, in classical logic, there um, we neither have that, nor do we have the reverse um, implication. So just from truth of phi, we cannot deduce that phi is realized. We need more than the truth. We need a proof. Not every true statement has a proof, in particular, not a constructive proof. The soundness theorem uh, here requires a constructive proof in order to produce the program, yeah? not the mere truth. It's a little bit weird because um, how should we be convinced of the truth of a mathematical statement if not by a truth, right? Uh, by a proof? But, um, but there are mathematical truths which firstly can only be proven using classical proof for which thumbness does not apply. And then secondly, and orthogonality to that, there are also mathematical truths which don't have any proof at all, even though they are true. If that is new to you, then um, go on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and Logic. And um, look up Gödel in completeness. I, uh, I really, really recommend this, this encyclopedia. Um, it, it, it's, it's a kind of Wikipedia, but for logic and philosophy and stuff. And it's not really like Wikipedia in, in the sense, uh, it's not like everyone can edit, but instead like as the editor carefully chooses among the logics and philosophy communities, some, uh, some, some lecturer, some, some postdocs, some professor, some, uh, well, someone, and then ask them, to write down this, this article, and then they will produce a very, very long uh, article, which is usually very, very good. Yeah? Uh, so I really like this encyclopedia. I also really like the Wikipedia, but for like these niche topics of philosophy and logic, this is the way to go. Okay. Um, okay, we have neither have that nor that. Now you've been asking about in which topos. Let's re-ask this, top this question in the effective topos.
So instead of asking whether this implication or that implication is true, we can ask whether it's true in the effective topos. In other words, we can ask whether this implication or that implication is realized. And then there's a nice surprise, um, namely, let's try again. Let's just use this. Uh, I mean the double thing um, in the effective topos, that is true. Um, it is true that, hmm? in other words, um, in other words, in, uh, in classical or constructive mathematics, we have the following. It is realized that phi is equivalent to phi being realizable. And if you wanted to prove that, you could do so using induction. Yeah? Um, by phi, I just mean an arbitrary statement in the first order language of heightening arithmetic. Some statement about numbers. For instance, that they infinitely many prime numbers or whatever. Yeah. Ah, right, what do you mean by true? In, in the end, um, it's a highly philosophical question, which I can definitely not answer, but uh, to an approximation I can, namely um, something is, a statement is true in the effective topos, if and only if it, that statement is realized. Okay, let's write that down. Um, that's more or less a definition, yeah? A statement phi is true in the effective topos, if and only if um, phi is realized. Okay, but that just shifts the problem because when is a statement realized? Well, if there's a realizer for it. And what does it mean uh, for a number to be a realizer? Well, have a look at these rules. Okay, but now you can again ask, um, what it, does it mean that for every number this holds true? At some point, you just need to accept uh, like a working definition of what, is, what, what, um, what true means. And then this definition is what we implicitly refer to when we define the realizability, because we say, well, a statement is realized if and only if there is a number E such that it's true that E realizes phi. Yeah? And at, so this just, at some point, you're reference, referencing some notion of truth, which is, which is built into your meta language. Your meta language might be informal English or Italian. Your meta language might also be ZZF, Z, uh, Z, uh, ZFC or whatever, ZFC, uh, but at some point, yeah. Um, it's getting philosophical. Um, okay, but still, this is nice. So in the effective purpose, this, this double, this equivalence is true, by which I mean that, um, this implication is realized. Um, so this um, shows you that the effective topos is quite different from the standard topos. Also the other examples from before showed you that, but that is, that is yet another one because from the point of view of the standard topos, um, the statement phi and the statement that phi is realized, those are two diff totally different statements. We neither have that nor that. However, in the effective topos, um, there's no difference between those. Phi is equivalent to the statement that phi is realized in. This is called the idempotence of the realizability semantics. Okay. And I think that is what I wanted to show you today. So we stop and meet tomorrow again. Um, at um, ah, yeah, uh, relatively late so, uh, at 13.30, okay.